There's been a lot of tears along the way. We can actually change the world. When did you have the moment, I made it, I did it? Hi everyone and welcome to another edition of She Made It, where we highlight some amazing female founders who are shaking up their industries and turning their light bulb ideas into reality. For this half hour, I'll be telling you all about some of my favorite brands to help you look and feel your best, whether it's a cozy blanket to help us unwind or a unique way for gifting to those you love. We have got you covered. Plus, I'll reveal my She Made It It list featuring Four small businesses you'll want to shop, all from dynamic women you'll want to support. So, let's get started. First up, I want to introduce you to Birdie Lashes, founder Yasmin Maya, an influencer who went from doing makeup tutorials to launching her own beauty brand. And she has overcome some incredible challenges on her path to success. Take a look. Influencer Yasmin Maya has over 3 million followers glued to her makeup and hair tutorials. Hey my beauties, welcome back to my channel. Bienvenidas de nuevo a mi canal, yo soy... At 30 years old, the wife and mom with baby number two on the way. Aww, oh, baby bump. <laughs> is also behind Birdie Lashes, the brand she officially launched last December with foam mink lashes and eyeliner that doubles as adhesive. What makes your lashes so easy because I know a lot of people are like, okay, it's another lash and I can't ever put them on myself. Our lashes are vegan, cruelty-free. They're super ultra soft and they're very light. So you're not gonna feel them heavy. You just pop it right on top of the eyeliner and it will stay. How proud are you of yourself? I look back and it's unbelievable. Hi guys. Okay, welcome to my channel. Nine years ago, Yasmin started her YouTube channel, Beauty Bird. She was living alone and in limbo, not in the Southern California town where she was raised, but in her birth country. I'm going actually through a really hard time right now. Walk us through what your childhood was like and what you went through. I was born in Mexico, very poor, like almost homeless. I didn't move here to the United States until I was like a year and three months. I grew up thinking I was part of this country and it wasn't until I got to high school when my mom got deported that it hit me with the reality that I am actually an illegal immigrant. Yasmin's father, also not a U.S. citizen, was deported shortly after her graduation. I started realizing I'm not going to be able to apply for a job or even go to college and get scholarships. I was in fear of deportation. Then at 18, Yasmin boldly left the only place she had called home bound for Tijuana, hoping to find work until she could return without worry. It's not a life, honestly, to just live in fear. My boyfriend went after me and we ended up getting married. But her husband had to patiently wait for her in the States. Even her parents had legally returned to this side of the border. Yasmin was on her own for three years, waiting on her green card. Well, every day I would cry. <laughs> So how did you overcome that? I started watching YouTube videos, girls doing makeup, and my mom was like, why don't you give it a try? And I was like, you know what, you're right, I have nothing to lose. Short on cash, Yasmin receives a camera and cosmetics from her mother. But then, she accidentally burned off her lashes while heating hot water for the shower. My little tiny eyelashes. I was so sad, and it was like, no, I'm not gonna give up. I went out and bought my first false lashes. Is that incredible? Yeah. Finally, reuniting with her family in May of 2013, she continued to post and rake in ads and sponsorships, and a new dream emerged. I started seeing more and more people saying, I unfortunately don't know how to apply lashes. She decided to develop an affordable false lash line for every eye shape. Whatever fiesta that you can think of, this is for you. Today, with close to 80,000 units of lashes sold and a multi-million dollar portfolio across all of her businesses, Yasmin feels her success as a Mexican Latina immigrant is especially poignant at this time. What I try to do is use my voice for other people that feel like they need to be quiet or ashamed of like where they're coming from. And so I take this month very serious to try and use it to our advantage and just be heard. Any dream is possible.
We have some samples here. They're so easy to use. And after our She Made It segment, Yasmin told us that Birdie Lashes saw an incredible boost in sales and website engagement. Most recently, the brand launched their Wing It Mascara. It's their first ever mascara with a custom dual tip, and it's waterproof, too. We all love that. Yay, Birdie Lashes. All right, I love this next one, too. Katherine Hamm is an entrepreneur who built her Baraby business based on comfort, and today she's turned her homemade weighted blankets into a multi-million dollar brand. Growing up in Germany, it was normal to nap during the afternoon. And then once I moved here to the US, I realized that actually nobody is napping. I think it's almost frowned upon. Feel like you need a nap? Well, Catherine Ham has you covered. I mean, no one has a master's in blankets. So what was <laughs> your background? I used to be an economist at the World Bank. With the constant traveling, I just felt exhausted, not being able to sleep, waking up multiple times at night. It just really affects you and it affects your day. Back in 2016, Catherine researched products to help her sleep and came across weighted blankets. It was just a complete game changer for me. I slept like never before. The only problem I had with this blanket that it just made me really hot. It was filled with all these plastic beads. So it was noisy and I just realized there was no way that I could sleep under that blanket for an entire night. After getting nearly 50 no's from potential manufacturers, Catherine took matters into her own hands, enlisting her mom to knit her first prototype out of their garage. The blanket was heavy, it looked beautiful, and it felt cozy, calming, and most importantly, it didn't make me hot. So that's when I realized that we had created something really special. She called the business Baraby, a combination of the words bear hug and lullaby. Baraby officially launched online in December 2018 and sold out in two weeks. What was the turning point? Because you turned this into a multi-million dollar business. One morning I woke up and I had an email from West Elm in my inbox and they wanted to see our blankets and come to our New York showroom. And I mean, I almost broke down laughing because we didn't have a showroom at that time. We were just- Right, so, you're like, come to my garage and see my mother and I. I think I did what any entrepreneur would do at this stage. So how about we come to your place? So we borrowed a hotel trolley and we pushed the whole trolley with 300 pounds of blankets down the street to West Elm and they immediately loved them and they were ready to order. Baraby made over $21 million in revenue in 2020 and recently had a cameo in an iconic TV show. So we just launched in Nordstrom's Countrywide and if you happen to watch Sex in the City, you might have spotted our blankets on set. Yeah, we've been growing from two people. Wait, 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 uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. You just really like <laughs> blew over that. Tell us the scene, tell us how that happened. Cynthia Nixon has a blanket and she was directing that scene. So it's like a pinch wow. me moment because I'm a huge fan. And as CEO, Catherine is trying to create a dreamy office environment for Barabee's workforce. We work from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And outside of these co-working hours, everyone can be flexible. Some people like to nap, some people like to walk their dogs, and other people like to spend time with their children. I assume that your employees respond well to that, just saying, if you get your work done whenever you can get it done, I want to encourage you to feel rested and healthy and inspire wellness. We don't have to earn rest. We actually need rest. I think it's a, it's it works wonders just to put 20 minutes on the calendar for a nap. For someone sitting at home who has an idea like this and who's not in the field they want to be in or has an idea about something that doesn't exist, what would be your best advice? Every business starts with an idea and it's more about the courage to take the first step doesn't that just make you want to curl up and take a good nap? Well, since Barabee's launch, the company has grown more than 5,000%. And in the spirit of Barabee's mission to create a calmer, more comforted world, this past spring, Barabee launched the Hug It, a sensory knot pillow that provides stylish, 
stress relief. We could all use that. Okay, but don't go to sleep just yet because there's much more to come. Next, supermodel turned mogul Winnie Harlow shares her personal story of building her skincare line, plus how one woman is reinventing the ear piercing experience. We'll be right back. Welcome back to She Made It. Winnie Harlow is a groundbreaking supermodel in her own right. Here's a look how one of the biggest names in fashion took her talents from the runway to the sun care aisle. Take a look. I've been able to showcase everyone else's work, and the things that they've labored on, and now I get to do the same for myself. It's a dream come true. For years, Winnie Harlow has been blazing a trail in the fashion industry, but now she's making strides in business as well. After everything you've been through, and I know this goes back to childhood, how important is that title for you, entrepreneur? My mom is a hairdresser and she had her own salon. My dad is a mechanic in Jamaica and still runs his own shop. I was thinking, where do I get this from? And I was just like, wait, it's in my blood, you know? It, it's from my parents. As a child, Winnie was diagnosed with the skin condition, vitiligo. It's hard enough being a kid to begin with, but right. kids were so mean and saying names to you. Tell me about your childhood. When you're in a small town, especially as a young kid, it feels like that is the end all and be all. It seems like the end of the world, but it's really just the beginning of your life. After competing on America's Next Top Model, Winnie started making a name for herself on high fashion runways and at photo shoots for big brands. Walking Victoria's Secret was incredible for me, life-changing. A lot of people don't know this, but I did try out for Victoria's Secret the year before and I didn't get it. And so getting it the second time was amazing. Like any Vogue cover I'm on, I'm the first model with vitiligo to be on that cover. So that is mind blowing to me because I had never seen myself represented growing up. Winnie says in 2018, an incident on a set inspired her to take action. I had this horrible experience on set at a shoot where no one wanted me to apply sunscreen. It made my, my skin look purple and gray and it wasn't great for the photo shoot. So, you know, I went without to get the best shots, but after two days of shooting from sun up to sun down in the Bahamas, I was burnt to a crisp. I was like in so much pain. I had to have doctors give me injections for, for pain, for inflammation. And I realized that there wasn't sun care on the market that made you look gorgeous and also be well protected. Winnie got to work developing skincare products. I think people think you're a supermodel, things just, you know, you just, you get a line and it doesn't work like that. I had no idea where to start. I had the idea, like it's my brainchild, but I had no business savvy. I think some of the most challenging things for me were one, hearing all those no's when we were, when we started fundraising, especially being a business that was created in a pandemic where things were already being pushed back with packaging and the formulas and like our factories shutting down for COVID. And, you know, there were so many steps back every time we were taking steps forward. 
Nearly three years later, Winnie raised $6.5 million from investors to launch K-Skin, a sun care line inspired by the beaches of her family's native Jamaica. I wanted to put things that I've used since I was a kid going to Jamaica and staying with my dad. They used to cut the aloe vera plant and rub it directly onto our skin for like mosquito bites or sunburns. We also have hydrating nectar, which is from different fruits and botanicals. Winnie hopes to inspire people to take care of and to love the skin they're in. What would you say as advice to young girls out there who are going through a tough time, who just like want to get through it and pursue her dream? I would say focus on yourself. There's only two things that you can really do in life. You can change things and those things that you can't change, you gotta move forward. Well, after we talked to Winnie for She Made It, the K-Skin team told us that K-Skin sales more than doubled. They've also expanded the line to include non-SPF lip and body care products, just the perfect pampering we need for fall and winter. Congratulations, Winnie. Great, great girl. Well, next up, a woman who is shaking up the piercing business. Rowan founder Louisa Schneider made it a point to create safe, hygienic, and fun piercing experiences for first-timers and those looking to get in on the ear party trend. Do your work, do your research, and don't let anyone make you feel like your idea is small. Because if you're passionate about it and you know that it resonates with other people, you were probably onto something. For entrepreneur Louisa Schneider, First-time ear piercing should not look like the scene from the hit movie Grease. No! Oh. And I desperately wanted an option that I knew would be safe, but that would also be joyful. And so that was really when I started thinking about why didn't that concept exist already? Louisa launched Rowan in 2018, a company looking to turn this sometimes ignored rite of passage into an experience worthy of a special celebration. To me, as a mom and as a woman, it was so clear that ear piercing is a milestone. And I was amazed that it had not been really modernized. So tell me how this idea started. I knew that even though malls were really suffering, one concept that continued to drive foot traffic was mall-based piercers. And around the time that my daughter was born, I took my nieces to get their ears pierced. And it wasn't a great experience. <laughs> The concept was pretty crowded and cluttered and tired. And I realized at that time that I would never take my daughter there. That's when Louisa started Rowan, a concierge ear piercing and subscription box service where customers could book a licensed nurse to perform piercings in the comfort of their own home. What was your first step? We started with a small proof of concept. So two nurses that were able to do a number of house calls and for us at Rowan, one of the most important things is thinking about the full experience. You may end up with an infection, and that is something that we want to avoid. The business quickly grew. Louisa then opened Rowan's first piercing studio in New York City, coincidentally just half a block away from a big box store that would play a major part in the next step of their journey. I got reached out to on LinkedIn, and the person who was reaching out to me had a Target address. And I did not think it was real. So I actually ignored it for a few weeks. And then there was another persistent outreach. And I thought, well, there is a chance this is real. So I'm going to take the call. Target offered Rowan the opportunity to open full service piercing studios in stores across California. I love it. But the pandemic brought on new challenges for the company. The thought of having an intimate moment piercing an ear during COVID was really uncertain. But as people became more knowledgeable about COVID and about safety protocol, there was this imprint of wanting a sterile environment. Rowan nurses are now in more than 200 target locations across the country. They've also opened a second standalone piercing studio, this time in Connecticut, and pierce as many as 20,000 ears a month. What do you think getting your ears pierced energetically represents? We say at Rowan, every piercing is a milestone and every milestone can be celebrated with a piercing. It's really a liberating form of self-expression. So doing it safely and having fun is really, you know, what it's all about. After our She Made It show, Rowan tells us they've since opened up 
nine studios across the country. And this month they are opening a location in Charlotte, North Carolina, and their very first mall location at the Mall of America. And it doesn't stop there. Chicago, Boston, and Miami, look out for a Rowan coming to you. I love hearing that. Well, up next, hear about women who made their dreams a reality from a female founder who is taking gifting to a whole new level and to a woman who's showing us that her business is on a roll. That's all coming up next. Welcome back to our She Made It special focused on pampering and getting ready for the holidays. You're about to meet the entrepreneurs behind innovative companies who are helping us make our lives a little bit easier. First up, Toki founder Jane Park, who is putting a creative spin on gift giving. Take a look. My parents and I immigrated from Korea when I was four. We lived above their convenience store and I did my homework behind the cash register. I loved having a front row seat to their courage and resilience. Even though I went to law school, my passion for New Horizons pulled me into entrepreneurship. I took a leap to start my first business, a beauty tech startup in 2007. I raised millions of dollars and sold it for even more. A few years ago at Christmas, I was throwing out bags and bags of used gift wrap because most of it wasn't recyclable. I thought about how my Korean grandmother would wrap gifts in squares of cloth, which we saved to reuse again and again. So I got to work reinventing gift wrap to make it more sustainable with the digital twist by inventing a QR gift tag, which allows you to show up with your gift by uploading a photo or video. Toki means rabbit in Korean. And my hope is that our products will hop from friend to friend and celebration to celebration. Well, since our She Made It segment, Toki is now nationwide. And check this out. This summer, they just launched their latest product line, the Toki Eco Gifting Set. This line uses recycled water bottles to further reduce our emissions. And guess what? With every order of their Eco Gifting Set, Toki is giving viewers free additional bags, all with free shipping. Well, moving on to brand number two now, that's actually the name. Number two, founded by a woman who is wiping away the competition while saving the planet at the same time. Take a look. My name is Samira Farr, and to me, true luxury is living in a land plush with trees rather than cutting them down to make toilet paper. That's why I created number two, a stylish toilet paper that not only gives you a clean wipe, but also helps preserve our forests. In 2017, after selling my first business, I began to research the toilet paper industry. It 
felt outdated. I was shocked to find that TV can be made from alternative fibers like bamboo, and that there aren't a lot of brands that don't use plastic packaging. I also learned that bamboo can grow at a much faster rate than trees, making it a way more eco-friendly option. I launched number two toilet paper in 2019 and have grown from selling only online to selling from bigger home goods stores like Urban Outfitters and Lowe's Home Improvement. Customers love the strength and quality of the teepee, as well as the stylish patterns. But most importantly, they are thrilled to be saving the planet one wipe at a time. Love this. Well, number two is now introducing 100% bamboo paper towels and facial tissue. And they have exciting news. Early next year, number two is now becoming Rizzy Home and will continue to expand Band, its line of home goods. Congratulations to them. I use this and just love the packaging. How else can you give toilet paper as a gift? Well, there's still much more to come. Up next, it's our She Made It It list for women-owned small businesses that will help you feel your best this season. We'll be right back. Welcome back. I have even more extraordinary female founded brands that I'm so excited to share with you on my She Made It It list. Brand number one, Dogwood Hill. In 2014, founder Jennifer Hunt saw a gap in the market for online art-driven holiday cards, so she did something about it. Jennifer's mission was to create a website where customers could go for personalized cards that eliminated the lengthy design times and pricey design fees. So. Dogwood Hill was born. With its collective of over 30 artists, Dogwood Hill is able to supply products within 10 days that are unique and personalized for you and your families. What a great way to wrap a gift and beautiful quality. All right, brand number two, Clean Circle. Lena Chow launched her skincare reusable products that replace single-use makeup wipes and cotton rounds. As the first-generation daughter whose mom worked as a seamstress, Lena knew the ins and outs of the textile industry and set out to create beauty reusables with certified clean fabrics. Clean Circle's mission is to reduce beauty waste all while protecting your skin from environmental stressors. These are great. Brand three, Palermo Body. Jessica Morelli is the founder and formulator of the skincare line that is all about nourishing the skin and stimulating the mind. At an early age, Jessica was inspired by the natural skincare practices of her Sicilian grandmother. Their revitalizing body scrub has become a favorite among customers, and just recently, Palermo Body launched their breast cancer initiative, donating $5 of every purchase of the scrub to breast cancer research. Such an unbelievable cause and really, really great products. All right, last up, Lucky 13 Candles. Lawyer and founder Amina Mack started her massage oil candle company in 2019 to connect her with her then fiance and now husband. Guess it worked. So she taught herself how to make candles that turn into massage oils with all natural ingredients. Amina reports that the connection with her husband is stronger than ever, and Lucky 13 Candles will be getting into retail stores 
early next year. Just love this. Well, that's all for our She Made It today. Thanks so much for watching. And remember to shop these small businesses, scan the QR code at the bottom of the screen, or head over to today.com slash shop. I'm Joel Martin. I'm so excited you watched the show. Such great entrepreneurs. And we'll see you next time. Joining us this morning, Kevin Curry, chef, author, and fit man cook. He's here to share a delicious dinner idea that won't break the budget. Beef and broccoli, I mean, takeout is always a crowd favorite. So this is a no sugar added beef and broccoli dish. So here is some lean flank steak. If okay. you are a part of the plant-based crew, then just use some mushrooms okay. or some chicken. So what we're gonna do first is just sprinkle in a little bit of this cornstarch. All right. And this is gonna help it to get really nice and crispy, but it's also gonna help the sauce to adhere to the beef. All right. All right, you're gonna mix that together together for us. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. And so once you mix it up, you're going to get your wok super like piping hot and then add in the beef. Now, this is the most Any important oil part. Any oil or oil? Um, you know, I, I like to use a little bit of avocado oil, okay. but vegetable oil is great too. All right. So you're going to get this nice and hot. And then once you will know it's ready to flip once it easily comes ah, off of pro tip. the pan. Yes. Okay. That is the pro tip. Now, we're going to move over here um, and you're going to cut up some bell pepper and some um, broccoli. So Top off the top, uh -huh. the bottom, and then side, and then just roll wow. your knife on the inside oh. of it, just like that. Isn't that cool? Yeah. And look, it just comes right out so easily. Yeah. And then just easily chop this into chunks, okay. and everything can be really nice and uniform. And that's gonna go in your yes. scallion. Yes, we're gonna add in some broccoli and then the bell pepper. Just imagine that's what we have right here. Okay. Okay, let me just chop off the top of it for us. There we go. Chop off the broccoli and then add this to there. Now inside here, we have a little bit of garlic and also some green onion. This is the- Garlic and green onion, yes, got it. This is the aroma part. How long now, is that gonna cook? This is gonna cook for about two to three minutes. Now for the broth. We have chicken broth uh -huh. here. You can use some beef broth if you want. A little bit of low sodium soy. Low sodium, Now this corn is starch. Correct, this is why, here's a corn starch. And to replace you know, the sugar, we are using ginger. Ginger's got a really nice peppery Ooh. and spicy flavor. Okay. You won't miss it. Mix this together. We're gonna add the beef back beef to our wok in. here. Okay. Boom. And then... The sauce goes in as well? The sauce goes in. It's gonna get really nice and slushy in here. Let's get now. down to the okay. tasting area, because you're garnishing. Boom. What are you garnishing that with? This is some sesame seeds, and you can toast these. You can also use some black ones if, if you're fancy. Mm. Mm. What's the verdict, folks? Yeah. Yeah. Delicious. Okay, good. And it's, right. and again, to your point, cheaper and healthier. It's cheaper. This meal comes out to less than $5 per meal. Wow. wow. For Ooh, four go. servings. That's great. Chef, sure, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chef. <laughs> Made dinner for the Melvin House tonight. Welcome back. Oh, something's smelling good. This morning on Today Food, chef, author, and certified nutritionist, 
Nia Rigdon is here to help us stick to our healthy New Year's resolutions. These are two easy veggie packed dinner recipes. It's from her new cookbook called Food Wise. Mia, good morning. Thanks for having me. Okay, I usually don't get excited when there's vegetables, but this looks and smells delicious. What are oh, we making? Well, thank you. So first we're gonna start with a super green spaghetti okay. with zucchini noodles. So have you ever used a spiralizer before? I've seen them, I've never attempted right, it. So you just kinda give it a whirl here. Okay. You wanna give that a try? Yeah, now you need the spiralizer, I guess, yeah, if you wanna you need do this the spiral recipe. You know, now a lot of grocery stores have pre-made zucchini oh, noodles, true, which true. can cut down on time. But I like to use the spiralizer. And then we're also gonna use the zucchini to make a really creamy zucchini pesto. Okay. So mm. I've already got a clove of garlic in here. Yeah. I'm gonna dump in this diced zucchini. I'll you keep can use, like the okay. leftover little nubs from that as well. Oh, okay. We've got olive oil, mm -hmm. lemon juice, this is a dairy-free pesto, oh, and it's yeah. not a chunky pesto. This is really creamy, and the zucchini okay. is adding some extra nutrients. Is that pine nuts you just put yeah, in there? Some okay, yeah, some toasted pine nuts and some basil. All We're right. not going to blend this because it's loud. Okay. And so over we'll pretend here, to blend. over here, we've got our pasta going. So the thing I like about this recipe mm -hmm. is that it has both. Mm. Zucchini noodles and pasta. Oh, I was just oh, noticing oh, that. So it's not good. just okay. zucchini noodles. Oh, nice. so, but let's just say you that wanted to go all zucchini noodles. You could noodles totally go all okay. zucchini noodles. You could also That's go all pasta. Yeah. Okay. So well, what I like pasta. about this is that when I'm making a pasta dish, and I talk about this a lot in the book, yeah. it's all about inverting the ratio. Because normally when you have pasta, it's like 90% pasta with like yeah. some sauce on it. Right. So then you're only eating carbs. Correct. Here we've got, we're using a chickpea pasta, which is high protein. It's got lots of fiber, and okay. then we're cutting the portion in half. Okay. So that so more zucchini than pasta. More zucchini, and this is also a high protein pasta. But you could serve this with chicken, fish. It looks incredible, guys. How does it, it taste? Really, it really it checks. You the like box. it? The chickpea pasta is a great call. We the, use that now at the house as well. Yep. The mm -hmm. chickpea pasta is great. More protein. This is better for your Bonza. blood sugar yeah. levels. Yeah, more right. fiber. And you just put the blended stuff really right good. in there. Yep. Oh my gosh, I can't just wait to taste up. that. I'm gonna eat what and stir. I'm stirring. All right. Okay. Moving on to the next recipe. Looking great, SG. Looking great. All right. We are making spicy broccoli poppers. Yum. I make these with my son all the time. Okay. Super easy. So what I've done here is we've mixed together just some water, some flour. I'm using a gluten-free all-purpose flour, but you okay. could use regular flour mm -hmm. and some sunflower seeds. And then you just dip the broccoli in there one by one, and then you're going to put them onto a sheet pan once okay. they're all dipped. You bake this in the oven for 10 minutes. Bake and not fry. Yes, bake okay. in the oven for 10 minutes. This is like my take on like a broccoli tempura. Yeah. And then they're going to come out like this, and then we mix together the sauce. Okay. So this is some white miso paste I have here. Mm -hmm. Some chili flakes. If you're making this with kids, my son Ozzy loves this. Okay. I just, he's three, so I leave out the chili flakes, but it's a fun way to prepare <laughs> yeah. broccoli. We've got some tamari mm -hmm. and some coconut aminos. Okay. Some lime juice. Right. Is that coconut wow. what? Coconut aminos. It's like a soy free. Are these uh, hard to find these items? What is no. the tamari? What's mm. that? Tamari is tamari. a gluten free. Close enough. Tomorrow oh. is a gluten free soy sauce. So you could oh. also use mm. soy sauce here, okay. but I prefer tamari. All the recipes in my book are gluten free. Oh, okay, great. So then you're just going to want to whisk this up. Mm -hmm. I'm and this I feel like we're going to have a five alarm fire here. <laughs> just turn yeah, it off. Is this off. whole meal gluten free? Everything is gluten free. Right gluten free. I've never had a gluten free meal until right now. Ever? Oh, really? Yeah. All right. Well, welcome. Oh, yeah. How'd you like it? Egg. Did you try the broccoli? Does it give you that kind of yeah. like tempura I feel? I feel like you could almost temp any vegetable you could tempura. Yes. Like the zucchini totally. or you yeah. could cauliflower, any, you could do with this. You could even throw some chicken in here. If you wanted to, could you deep fry that? You could, or you could also use an air fryer. Oh, there you go. You could order yeah. pizza okay. too, Al. There you go. <laughs> it's a realm but of a vegan pizza. <laughs> yes. You could order pizza. pizza. One of those okay, of cool. Pizza. So, yeah, once, we whisk that up once and then this what? is all whisked up, then we're going to throw the broccoli that we baked in here. Okay. Do you wait for it to cool or just go right in? Yeah, it depends if you don't want to burn your fingers. You right. Well, wait for it to cool, cool. But, yes. you know. And then we just mix it up okay. and then we throw it back on the sheet pan. We bake it for another 10 oh, minutes oh. and then we stick the broiler on to, to get them nice and crispy Ooh. like they are here. And yeah. What about air voila. fryer? Could you put that in the air fryer? She should just totally put it in the air fryer. That's okay. Yeah. 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 It was like the 10 air fryer right. is Where'd a little go? bit quicker. I missed that. Where yeah, were you? That was like 20 seconds ago. the lack of gluten. Did you take a little trick? I did. I did. This has got a nice little bite to it, by the way. The broccoli? It's got a little bite. 
Yeah. That's, like that. that's, that's There's no substitute place. for flavor here. It's really no, flavor. No, it's really good. That's cool. what we're going for. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Congrats on the book. At the end of a long week, let's face it, you barely have any energy left to cook, so it's good to have a go-to dish you can whip up pretty quickly. We got you covered. Josh Mac Mama Clay is a chef instructor and teaches on Milk Street TV. He's going to show us his basil broccoli pasta. I, I just tiptoed through that one, Josh. I'm glad I got you it. You did great. Thank you, honey. Tell us, tell us about what we're making. So essentially what we're making is a broccoli pesto. And it starts with two pounds of broccoli. Now, more often than not, you will be able to get broccoli florets in just the big bags. But if you end up working with a large crown, yeah. cutting it down is actually super, super simple. And I'm not even going to look at it. No, wait. Oh, no. wow. Okay, well, now you're showing no. off. That's a pro tip. I am showing off a little bit. That's a pro tip. But the reason why I cut it down into steaks like that is because I'm getting this really, really fantastic, mm -hmm. like, flat surface yeah. area. And that is going to make direct contact with my pan. And therefore, when it roasts in an oven at 400 degrees Fahrenheit, mm -hmm. it's going to get a really nice brown on it. Okay. And that's going to develop a really beautiful, savory flavor. Okay. But you want to go ahead and just discard any of the stems. You don't need those for this recipe. Mm -hmm. Okay. But... Break your broccoli florets down into one and a half inch pieces. Again, you don't have to be particularly careful about this. Mm -hmm. But all you're going to do is bring all of that broccoli together in yeah. a bowl, Beautiful. along with two teaspoons, actually, yeah, two teaspoons of regular like vegetable oil. Okay. Any neutral oil, avocado oil will work. And you're also going to follow that up with a little bit of salt. Okay. okay. So I believe it's two tablespoons and one teaspoon of salt in here. Okay. We're going to just give that a little toss. And then we're going to go ahead and arrange that on our sheet here. I have a baking sheet lined with tin foil. I'm just going to dump it right on out. Beautiful. And here's my little pro tip. You want to make sure that you're putting everything cut side down. Okay. That cut, way all of that flat down. surface wow. area Smart. that you yeah. established, that's going to get really, really nicely seared in the oven. Okay. So once you get that nice and arranged... You throw it in the oven, simple as that. So again, awesome. 400 degrees Fahrenheit, uh -huh. and I already have one that is working in there. So we'll take a peek at Look that at your one little later. mitt. That's a cute, <laughs> the cutest little oven mitt. <laughs> Thank you. I never, yeah, no, I have so these big. big like sausage patty I hands. I love that. So no, when right you're size. working with like, it is the right size. It makes things a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Now, while that's roasting off in the oven, we could go ahead and take a look at our pot here. Here, I actually have a large pot set up with six cups of water. Now, six cups is not typically what you would cook pasta in, right. um, but we're cooking in less water here on purpose, so that way we develop a lot of starches. Yeah. Uh, and that's going to help this sauce get really luscious. Okay, we and only have a minute pasta. left, so will you just help Ooh, us? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Totally, totally. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and blanch our basil. basil. That only takes about five uh -huh. seconds. And this is the same water that we would cook the pasta in. Okay. Like I said, we blanch it for five seconds, uh -huh. and then we throw it into an ice bath. This step is totally optional, but it really helps the sauce maintain its bright green color. Okay, beautiful. So, once we get that in there, All right. we'll go ahead and fish that out, and we'll blend it up. Okay, so, and so you hit it, you put it in the little food processor, and, you add, it, and you, add, you add to it. Oil. So, yep, here we have our food processor. I'm just going to throw my basil right on in. If a little bit of water makes its way in, that's no problem. But you'll hit that with a quarter cup of olive oil. Uh-huh. Great along with a quarter cup of grated Parmesan cheese. Yum. Two cloves of garlic that have yep. been roughly chopped. And my secret ingredient here, we have some capers. Oh, I love capers. Now that's going capers. to add really nice. Yeah, they're okay. really, really fantastic. So after you yeah. grind that up and just put that right over the pasta? And some lemon. Yeah, we're also going nice. to throw in a little bit of lemon juice. And if you have time, uh -huh. you can go always uh, throw in lemon All right, zest. Josh, why don't you we'll show us the finished product? Because we got to rock. Ah, you got it. So we're going to Beautiful. bring that together right before your very eyes. Beautiful. Show us so, what you got. Show us what you got, Josh. Beautiful. Got Josh, thank you so much. That looks really delish. We appreciate that. Absolutely. For that, for that recipe, go to today.com slash food. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Josh. You got it. Thank you.
It's not only cheesy, and comforting. It's also got some great color too. I love it. Missy Robbins is a James Beard award-winning chef and owner of Lilia and Missy Restaurants. She's out with her second book called Pasta, the Spirit and Craft of Italy's Greatest Food. Missy's right here near us in Brooklyn uh -huh. in her kitchen right now. Missy, by the way, you were a home run on the eight o'clock hour. We're still talking about that breakfast pasta. Oh, we uh -huh. get it. No, we want it. We want <laughs> you to come make it for us. But for us, you're going to make. I will do that anytime I'm allowed. Yay. I love it. Okay, so you're making a broccoli pesto. This mm -hmm. is one of your favorites tell us why yeah this one this one's a little later than the last segment where we did carbonara and I I, I bragged about how rich it is okay. this one's a little later um, there's a few reasons I love this one it's it's got broccoli it's healthy it's I developed this when when I was trying to eat healthier and wanted to include more vegetables and okay. how do I do that but still have a little pasta so it starts with it starts with you can use broccoli you can use broccoli Rob in my in my recipe I have both um, you kind of just separate the florets, the mm -hmm. leaves, and then um, blanch it, shock it, chop it. So that's a, a, just a quick cook. Um, and you end up with this. Um, and then the leaves and basil, you also mm. blanch and do a puree. Okay. Um, and then we use pecorino. Mm. We use parmigiano. So it's still so got the all yummy the stuff in there. Traditional, yeah, yeah, all the yummy stuff. Yeah. It's, not, it's, not, it's not like... You Can know, I ask diet. real quick about it's, that it's, pesto? You was that a pesto you poured in? Is that what the basil was? That that was that was just a puree. Puree. Um, okay. And then this is olive oil, which will mm. kind of bind it all together. Mm. And then the gnocchi. One of the reasons I love them, I think, I think a you can make them ahead of time. You can you can make them. You can cook them ahead of time and hold them overnight. This is a ricotta gnocchi Ooh. that's uh, really foolproof. Yum. Like you, you cannot screw this up. So and, should you just and, not buy the, uh, you know, the frozen okay. ones? And do I need you to do the real thing? You should never buy. Never. Is that horrible ever. of me? Okay, uh, I'm never. sorry. I won't buy the frozen ones anymore. I mean, this is just so easy, and I, I love it also because it's great to make with kids. Mm. Really great to make with kids. It's an easy one. Um, I roll this dough out into ropes, you see, uh -huh. and then I cut them into pieces. Mm. And then if you want a little extra fancy, you go. Um, you want to make sure there's enough flour so they don't stick. The dough can uh -huh. get a little sticky. And we have this little paddle, very traditional uh -huh. gnocchi board. Um, and you just kind of roll it down uh -huh. like this. Uh -huh. Also, like, really fun for kids, like great hand-eye coordination. Ah. Um, oh. And I know once, awesome. once you taste those, you probably can't go back. So I guess I can see that. Exactly. And, <laughs> and they're just easier than potato gnocchi. So I have them cooking in back. It's really hard. Like, with traditional pasta, egg pasta, it's so delicate. It's pretty hard to screw these guys up. Like, they, you want to cook them till they float to the top, but if they float and they cook another one or two minutes, you're okay. You're going to end up with something very, very light. That's okay. the other thing with these. There's a lot of cheese. Um, I have my broccoli pesto on the Oof. stove here. Um, Yum. And and just and and it's got a little pasta water to loosen it up. So mm -hmm. pasta water is a really important ingredient when you're making pasta. It adds starch. It adds a little salt. And we just go right in the pan okay. here. Coat it. Right. And then how do you know when it's ready? Well, you're going to marry them together. Okay. So you're going to just toss, 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 mm. toss, mm. toss, toss, until those gnocchi kind of absorb into into the uh, sauce, and the sauce absorbs into the gnocchi. Look and they you become I was just going to say, mine would be all over the floor. I'm just mesmerized right I mean, now. you should try it at home. We, yeah. You know, when we teach young cooks, we tell them to take beans home and, <laughs> and just flip beans okay. forever and ever. Oh. Um, and then we just go right here. Serve it up. Um, for the, Look for at the that. final plate. Oh, my gosh. I just want a fork right um, now. Mm. And these, these gnocchi, you know, in the, in the book, we have um, tons of recipes for different red sauces. The, that's like one of my favorite things in the world to eat. Missy, is, is just red sauce gnocchi. Missy, um, that is a that's a parm. ten plus. Look at that, yeah, a little more parm. We thank you so much, um, and we're so excited thank again. You. You're joining us from your Brooklyn kitchen, but you've got you're the owner of Lilia and Missy, the Missy. restaurants in New York. So thanks again. Yeah, uh, I hope to see you guys soon. Us too. For this recipe, go to today.com slash food. And for Missy's book, you can head to today.com slash shop. It's Thank called pasta. Thank you so much.
welcome back for this week's Cooking with Cal, pasta and a great cause. They're both on the menu, and this dinner did not disappoint. It's another edition of Cooking with Cal. What are we making today? Chickpea broccoli pasta. Yes! So this recipe actually comes from the Serving New York cookbook. Uh, a lot of chefs have put their recipes in here, and we are making Mark Meyer from Cook Shop his broccoli and chickpea pasta. So, uh, it's a little one. It is a little one. Break it in half. I need you to make this even smaller, because could you eat this in one bite? I guess you could eat some of it. How do you like uncooked broccoli? <laughs> So here's what I need you to do. Mm -hmm. You see these little broccolis? Mm -hmm. Can you start breaking that apart? These are all small enough, right? Yeah. Yeah, I just break it. Okay, so you don't like raw broccoli, right? Mm -hmm. So we gotta cook it. I'm gonna put these in boiling water. Ugh. Nice. So let's add some olive oil. Let's put the lemon in. Do it. Let's do a little salt and pepper. Oh. I'm sure then you're taller. See, I'm the pepper. So tall people do salt? Yeah. Short people do pepper? No, I'm the pepper. Now we're going to set this here. Before we slice the garlic, we're going to put the pasta in the water. I want to eat raw pasta. I just want it. Oh, it's too hard. Feel how hard it is. <laughs> you remember what to do? Oh, you do. Good job. Just enough to get the skin off. When they're raw, they're spicy, but we're gonna cook them. <coughs> Did you put your finger in your mouth? Yeah. What did I tell you? Can you wash my hands so they don't be spicy? Yes, as soon as we're done with this, okay? And we're gonna add some cheese. Ooh, we gotta shred some cheese. Okay. Oh, we need a whole cup of grated cheese. That's gonna take forever. <laughs> it's <good>. Like tonight? <laughs> I hope it's done in time for dinner. Now I'm sweating. I hate grating cheese. I mean, I don't like grating cheese. Uh, um, it's the bad one. I know, I'm sorry. I think we're done. And more oil. Sprinkle it all over. I like this in oil. Hot. I'm gonna blow it for you. Yummy, yummy. Good job, bud. I love a dinner also that can feed everybody. Yeah. Because Oliver, if you cut it up small enough, he's, there you go. he's enjoying and it. And hate is a bad word, Mom. Hate is a bad word. <laughs> Catch myself all day long. Not that I hate that many things. Right. I just, right. I don't like things. Never mind. <laughs> um, you can find the recipe at today.com slash food. And by the way, both the digital and hard copy versions of Serving New York benefit a restaurant worker relief fund. The book has raised more than $200,000 so far. That's fantastic. Ah, uh, this morning on Today Food, dinner recipes that cut the carbs. And Chef Richard Ingram knows about eating well to win. In fact, he knows so much about it. He wrote a book about it. Yes. By the way, the chef for almost two decades has been the personal chef to NBA legend Dwayne Wade and his superstar wife, actress Gabrielle Union, one of our favorite celebrity couples here at the show, yes. by the way. This morning, the chef is here this morning to share a recipe straight from their kitchen. I was asking yeah. you during the commercial break if this is something you actually cook for me, and you said yes. this, this is a go-to. It's a definitely a go-to dish. So a lot of folks in January, they make this commitment to start eating clean, to eat healthy, to eat right. right. What are some things that folks should remember when they're trying to do that? Well, when you're trying to eat healthier, one thing that you want to remember is that portion size is awesome, okay. you know? Portion size, everything in moderation, drink a lot of water, and it's when you eat certain things. So I will eat your carbs earlier in the day so that they can help you burn throughout the day and then slack off on the carbs late at night. Before we get into it, John, come a little closer because I want the audience to see. This is what you get for Christmas when you work for D. Wade. 
Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It gives yeah. you a championship. Nice. Right? That's yeah. like a tie. So. That's, <laughs> that's good. Yeah. All right. So this Thank one, we're going to go with uh, so sea bass and, and, and broccoli. Right. So what we have here is a miso roasted sea bass. So what we have here is brown sugar and miso. Okay. Mm. Okay. We have a little bit of ponzu that we're going to add in here. Ponzu is actually a fortified uh, soy sauce. Okay. So it has a little bit of uh, citrus in it. Here we have ginger juice. Now, if you can't find ginger juice, if you don't want to make your own, Another great substitute is to go and get that uh, that pickled ginger. Pickled ginger. Uh-huh. 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 And you can use that juice. Mm. Here we have marin, which is a sweet uh, rice wine. And then we have some sake here. Oh, right? sake. Ooh. Okay. Take a little shot. Then there you put the rest you, Exactly. Got it. Right? So we put that in and we stir it around just like so. Okay, to make our marinade. How long are you going to let the sea bass marinate? Now, you can you can marinate this from anywhere from two hours to overnight. Okay. Mm. Okay. The longer you let it marinate, then of course the more flavor that you're gonna get in it. Okay. So okay. now we'll take it, our marinade, put it right over our sea bass, just mm. like so. And if you don't like sea bass, if you wanna swap it out. No, if you want to swap it out, you can do salmon with it. You can do cod with it if you want to yeah. as well. But as Hoda pointed out, why would you? Right, why would yeah. you do that? Now, if you don't have one of these dishes, and what I like to do as well is to put my sea bass in a bag mm. with the marinade, and then you can kind of smush it around. Oh, there you go. Oh. Right, yeah. right. So we've let it marinate. Now uh-huh. we're going to throw it on the grill. How so, long on each side? Now, what you do is you take your sea bass with your tongs, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, if you can get them working. Okay, and then you take and you go ahead and put it right on your grill, okay. just like so. About, uh, maybe about two minutes on two each minutes. side. Two minutes, right? Quack, quack. Is there a way that you know it's done? Now, the way that you know it is done is if it turns opaque, which is a nice mm-hmm. color, mm-hmm. or it starts to flake. But if you don't want to ruin it, what you do is you could take a thermometer mm-hmm. and stick it right in. Now, if it goes all the way in through, yeah. then it's done. Okay. If you oh, feel a little resistance, oh, then oh, it's not easy. done. Right? So our sea bass oh, is done. Let's Ours talk is about almost this. done, speaking of done. Mm-hmm. Talk about the <laughs> so you use regular broccoli or do you use the broccolini? So now, I use broccoli rob in the recipe, but you can use broccolini. Now, the difference is your broccoli rob is actually... Uh, in the turnip family, whereas oh. your broccolini and your broccoli is on the cabbage side. 30 seconds okay. left. So. All right. So now what you would do is you would take your broccoli, you would put it in your water here, and what you're doing is you're, uh, you're shocking it. Mm-hmm. You take it out of the boiling water, put it in here to stop the cooking process, to carry over cooking. Then blanch it. And then you're blanching it, yeah. right? So then you come here, put it right inside of your pan, mm-hmm. you add a little bit of your garlic, you add some ginger. Uh, you add a little bit of your red pepper what's plate. Order, guys? What you think over there? Right? We have happy plates. So. Good. Mm-hmm. It's clean plate club. Saute it up a little bit. And that's it. That's, that's it. That's fairly easy, chef. It is. And then you, you just plate it up just like so. Beautiful. And then you have a little bit of your marinade left over. On and top. there you go. Chef Richard, thank you. Good morning, guys. Welcome to The Boost. We're going to start your day off with a boost of positivity. First up, it is World Diabetes Day, and we want to introduce you to a health and fitness coach who was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at just seven years old. Well, now she is working to define the disease and help others take ownership of their health. Dylan has her story. As a health and fitness coach, Lauren Bongiorno has planked, curled, and floated her way to an impressive following. Hello and welcome. But despite her physical strength, for Lauren, it's what's on the inside that has reached far more. I was seven years old when I was diagnosed. Doctors told my parents, your daughter has type 1 diabetes, an autoimmune disease where your body no longer produces insulin, um, which is a necessary hormone to live. What does a seven-year-old think when you're given this diagnosis? I don't think I fully understood um, what that diagnosis meant. All I remember is my parents telling me, this isn't going to stop you from doing anything as long as you take care of yourself. Lauren and her family threw themselves into raising awareness and hoping for a cure. My family's life has been around really advocating for a cure and raising money for a cure because that's the promise that they told us. They said it's just right around the corner, it's five years away. But by college, there was still no cure and Lauren started experiencing setbacks. Everything about my life was about being perfect. I went to the doctors and they were celebrating me, high five my parents being like, your child is amazing. And it was in that moment that I actually realized, wait a second, 
On paper, to the medical system, I looked perfect, but inside, I felt so unhealthy. Lauren knew she needed to find a more sustainable relationship with diet and exercise. I didn't want to have to wait for a cure to be thriving and living an empowered life. I wanted to figure out a way of how to do that right now. With that realization came a desire to become a certified health coach and the pursuit of a new career. I created Lauren Bundernal Diabetes Coaching in 2015 just to serve a need that I had and a problem that I identified. Did you find that that information wasn't out there? With diabetes, then you get your diagnosis and they hand you a few different pamphlets. You check them with the endocrinologist if you're lucky enough to have an endocrinologist and that's about it. And so really what we do is we create intimate coaching programs and online courses and resources like the Diabetic Health Journal that allow people to take ownership of their health, to identify their patterns within their body, to be able to feel good mind and body. Her awareness and action approach has attracted thousands of clients fighting similar battles. What we're really doing is take the complexity out of managing your diabetes and your numbers. Like something as simple as what I like to call sugar squats. When your blood sugar is starting to go high, you start doing body weight squats because it helps those big muscle groups kind of utilize the insulin a little bit more. We have people all around the world who have tagged us doing these sugar squats in on airplanes, in restaurants. That's why Instagram and social media is such an incredible place um, to be and to find community. That coincides perfectly with your Instagram account because you know, you, you do get into the realities of, of living with diabetes. Is, why is that important for you to get that message out there? If I show it all. I, I want to allow people to understand that in those moments when things aren't going well with your blood sugars, which it's going to happen, that self-compassion and that vulnerability and that openness to ask for help, right, and support from the people in your life is, is so important. That community aspect of feeling less alone is, is so crucial. For Lauren, it's less of a job and more of a calling. You always say that you want to redefine the word diabetic. In, in what way? The word diabetic can make you feel like you're less than, like you are broken, like you're not whole. And the word diabetic is something that if you own it and you feel good about yourself, then the word diabetic means anything you want it to be. It can mean unstoppable. Resilience. We took back control of not waiting for that cure, but saying, hey, we're gonna celebrate all the lessons that life gave us. We're gonna celebrate the opportunity to learn how we can together move forward and change what the future of diabetes looks like. Another champion of the chronic disease is music superstar Nick Jonas. Chanel recently sat down with his mom, Denise, chatting about how she raised the famous brothers and Nick's journey with type one diabetes. Take a look. I um, never wanted to have girls, daughters, because I just thought it would be fun to have boys. Four boys to be exact, Kevin, Joe, Nick, and Franklin. Before the band, there was a childhood of adventure. Life in our home was always exciting, laughter, things breaking. <laughs> I guess if you have four boys, a couch is not just a couch. Mm, well said. Yeah. <laughs> we had a big basement uh, when we lived in New Jersey. And that basement was like not mine for any purpose at all. It was just their playground. I mean, they roller skated down there, they skateboarded, they built forts, built stages. It made me very happy, but there's always breakfast on the table in the morning. What was your parenting style? I tend to be strict. I'm also very orderly, very neat, very clean. I just trained them from a young age how to, how to do that. Early on, my husband and I felt like we're not just raising kids, we're raising adults. And we want to raise them with the integrity and the moral values that we have. So how did music come into play? My husband is the real musician, a music lover. He recognized that at an early age in Nicholas specifically, he was three and he was singing a song. He hit a wrong note and he went, he backed up as if to rewind and he sang it correctly and he went at three at three and my husband was like this one is beyond me as the boys got older their passion for performing only grew i was pregnant with frankie our fourth child when they actually got signed to a manager and they immediately booked commercials and nick 
really couldn't read that well at that time, but he could sing like nobody's business. And he booked his first show, his first Broadway musical, A Christmas Carol. These are their first headshots. Wow. They're so silly. Look, I mean, Kevin, Joe, they look so smolder. And this That's so smolder. cute, though. But boy, they got a lot of work. How did you keep the reins to it? I don't know if I did. I look back and it's like, how did I do that? I basically had a full-time job driving them into New York every day. And I had responsibilities at our church that we pastored. I guess just kept pressing on because that's just what we did as Jonah's family. We just pressed on. So when did you know, you know what? I think we have something here. It was during that time. It was just like, what, what more can we accomplish? I felt like we've made it, we've done it all. Never thinking what would happen would happen. What happened was the Jonas Brothers, Kevin, Joe, and Nick, formed a band. The first time they started touring was just like in the tri-state area. And when they come home, there's always a meal and laundry. I mean, I remember one time there was not turn enough turnaround time, like 24 hours to get the jeans dry. <laughs> All their Relatable. jeans washing and drying. It was just like, I started to have to send them out. In three years time, mall shows and school assemblies became sold out arenas around the world. I realized my role was being taken now by people that you, we paid. Mm -hmm. There's a, a catering company that cooks the meals and there's someone who dresses them, does their laundry, mm -hmm. irons everything. And it's like, okay, what do I do? That was tough. So what do you do? I mean, the good Lord made you their mother. <sighs> I just, I had to enjoy it. I had to, I had to learn how to just say, this is my plate and this is, I'm gonna enjoy this. And enjoy she did. Nearly 20 years later, the boys now have six successful albums and more than 13 billion streams globally. The screaming girls and the whole thing. What was that like as a mom? It really fills my heart with joy Does when it? I see that. I remember being that girl. I was in love with Mark Hamill. I thought I was gonna <laughs> marry him for a whole year. So I know what those girls are feeling. And I, I thought, oh, I love that. I want them to feel that way for my kids. How do, the, how do they receive it? I'm sure there's a lot of o overwhelming thoughts and there's a lot of, wow, <laughs> strut oh, my no. stuff. Do any of them say they're the favorite? Oh, yes. I think they all think Nick's the favorite. <laughs> but I really don't have a favorite. I mean, there are different things for different ones. Favorite Jonas Brothers song? Pushing me away. You push, push, push me away. That's my favorite song. I think it's about me. <laughs> you could ask but, him if you wanted. But it speaks to me about myself and in areas that I need to mellow out. The fans, the memories, the music, all highs for the Jonas family. But one of the more trying times, Nick's diabetes diagnosis at 13. First, you feel guilt. You go through this, session, this period where you as a parent think, what did I do to my child? And then you get, you have anger and you're angry that this happened. And then you feel sorrow and grief because your child's lost something, you've lost a part of your child, and you know that it's something you're gonna deal with. It was tough. What got you through those moments? Faith plays like the major role in our lives as a family. And in the last few years, the family has grown even bigger. Does it feel good that they found yes. love? Yes, it feels absolutely wonderful. Because yeah. as a mom, I've raised you this way, and I, how are you gonna find that, someone I'm, that's you're an equal to yeah, you that will, yeah. and honestly, I could not be more blessed. They are three lovely women. And they've given us five beautiful granddaughters. Can you exhale now? Do you ever exhale as a mother? I don't think you really exhale, but not in a bad way. You're always their parent. You know the things that they're experiencing that nobody else sees. I think the exhale is, okay, we they're, they're not ours anymore. You got their wives, yeah. they can deal with this. Favorite moment of this wild ride you guys have had together was mom and sons. Seeing all of them, the great response of their fans loving them, but also the response of the gift they're giving the people with what they were created to do.
on the boost with a former undercover CIA officer who pivoted her career to embark on a new chapter, running the hottest pajama country, uh, company around. Petite plume is worn by celebrities and royals all around the world. NBC's Maggie Vespa has the extraordinary true story of its founder and the inspiration behind the brand. Good job. In a sun-drenched living room in suburban Chicago, a decades-old government secret I mean, hidden behind carefree smiles in family photos. Feel this. Fashion entrepreneur Emily exactly. Hikade now ready Hikade. to share her story. You had a prior career. I'll just I did. say, what was that? Oh, you're gonna make me say it. A career so secretive she struggles to discuss it. I worked as a case officer for the CIA. How did it feel to say it? Not great. Years of posing as an average American family in war zones around the world don't fade fast. Hikati's husband, Christopher, also worked for the CIA. The couple's four sons, though, kept in the dark. What did they think your job was? Diplomats. We work for the embassy. In reality, work put their lives in grave danger. We're the ones who spot, assess, develop, and recruit clandestine sources. I do remember going to a meeting, and there was a possibility that the person I was meeting with might be wearing a suicide vest. But any fear was countered by a drive to serve her country. A Wisconsin native with a love of languages, Hikade learned Arabic after September 11th and signed up for posts across East Africa and the Middle East. I was going to a very important meeting uh, in the middle of the Indian Ocean, and I was on a single prop plane, and there was a storm, and the plane started going out of control, and it started spinning sideways, heading toward the water. And I had three little kids at home. I've given a lot for my country at that point. And, I, <sighs> and that's where you realize I think my kids needed me more. Nearly a decade ago, Hikade's time in the CIA was done. This is the holiday collection. Her new mission, sleepwear. From the CIA to pajamas. Yeah, natural pivot. <laughs> Hikade launched Petite Plume from an undisclosed location in East Africa and sales soared with celebrities buying in like Gwyneth Paltrow and Prince George, who wore the PJs during a 2016 meeting with then President Obama. That was incredible. That was something. We were still such a new company. Since then, the family has moved back to the U.S. Christopher retiring, too, now able to share their story. See? <laughs> yeah, including only recently with their kids. Is it something that you're proud of your parents for? Yes, very, yeah. What are you proud of? Just everything, the, how far we traveled on, on this earth and everything they've done for me. Hikade's past life, a reminder of what matters most. The world is a big and beautiful place and filled with so many different kinds of people, but when you scrape away the differences of what we wear and how we dress, we're all the same. We all want what's best for our kids. We all want a safe place to raise them. Seven. In the name of family, decades of cover now officially lifted. Our next story continues to prove that it is never too late to start a new chapter, and this one, it's a real treat. After years of working in finance, a former Wall Street trader discovered a delicious hidden talent. Chanel learned how she traded in her blue chips on Wall Street for chocolate chips in the kitchen. Recipes are for the birds and never measure. Here at Chelly's Chocolate Chips in Williamsburg, Virginia, 63-year-old Gina Chelly is in the zone. You can't be stingy with the chips. Every day, she cranks out dozens of cookies from this kitchen with her husband Anthony's help. It's where the magic's gonna happen, kids. A far cry from their past lives in a very different world. I got my BA in economics. I graduated college in 1981. And I knew I wanted to be on Wall Street. Like, that was my dream. Gina ended up working in commodities trading for several brokerage firms. We executed orders. You know, I went out and got business. We traded. I went down to the trading floor a lot. And that's actually how I met my husband. They got married, and after 13 years in finance, Gina realized she wanted to be a stay-at-home mom instead, raising four kids. I just felt that I was the luckiest woman 
in the world. That was the culmination of my life. But it was also the beginning of this business. That's because as a mom, Gina discovered she had a knack for making really good cookies. I know it's so cliche, but I was the mother bringing the cookies to all the games. I ran the bake table at the Christmas fair and my wedding cookies were so popular, there was like insider trading on them. People like would come in early, buy them, put them under the table before they even went out for sale. So after the kids were all grown, Gina, bored with an empty nest, decided to get back into the market in 2018. Not in blue chips, but chocolate chips. I said to my husband, why don't I sell cookies? And he's like, what? I don't, why not? I'm, looks like people like them. Let's try it. And we wound up buying like equipment like this. We didn't know anything how to buy a, an oven like that or these kind of work tables. And, and it really just sort of morphed. And I started winning like accolades. Best of in Williamsburg and best in coastal Virginia. And then of course, pandemic hit. Like many businesses during COVID, she pivoted to shipping. I'm gonna do three, four packs, Aunt. Starting online at Gold Belly, but eventually selling through several high-end retailers. We're really, really proud of not knowing what we were doing, doing this on a whim, and now we're winning. We'll do 300 cookies for an event for Valentine's Day. Numbers like that don't fuss me. My first big order like that, I was like a deer in the headlights. But now I could do 10 dozen on one leg, standing up, hand behind my back. Gina says her time on Wall Street was a key ingredient to success. I think commodities taught me the highs and lows of a market. I think everything in life is a set up. And you don't realize it at the time. You know, it could have been 20 years ago. Set me up for this place in time. If you have something in your heart that you want to do, try it. Like, and again, back to commodities. If it succeeds, fantastic. If it doesn't, it's not the end of the world. Commodities for cookies, a trade that's so far paying off pretty well. When I do the cookies, it's sort of my art. Like I'm channeling something in my head through my hands. It's like such a kick, like all the time when people bite into it and they're like, these are really delicious. Like that makes me really, really happy. to the boost. They say laughter is the best medicine and you are about to meet a mom who proves that to be true. 
She turned to comedy during one of the most difficult times in her life, and now she has made it her mission to keep others laughing. My friend Karen Swenson has her story. I got a party tomorrow night. When am I wearing a black dress? I don't gotta get a spank. I don't gotta get a crank. If you think that I'm gonna suffer the whole night to make you think that I'm three pounds thinner, you're out of your mind. Her 200,000 Instagram followers know her as one funny Lisa Marie. But before she became an accidental internet comedian, Lisa Marie Riley from Staten Island, New York, was a court stenographer. I'm a stenographer. I say That's this with all forever. due respect, but I cannot imagine you having to be quiet. I wasn't. I never was. I never <laughs> was. I never was. I was always doing 10,000 things. I was always most annoying, but I was good at what I did. That much I can say. But when her husband, David Riley, was diagnosed with cancer in 2019, Lisa had to take a leave of absence to help take care of him. Imagine. She took to Instagram as an outlet. $27.14 later, I got the early bird special. How much is the late crow? I want the late crow. And her first post was on his first day of chemotherapy. I was always in the car because we were outside of chemo and it just became a thing and it made time pass much easier, you know? Listen to me, behind the screen, everybody's got something going on, no matter what it is. Good stuff, bad stuff, tragic stuff, unfortunately. But I made all these friends where we came to a place where we could all just laugh about nothing. Nobody commits more crimes and breaks more rules than a mother in a school pickup line. I don't want to hear it. Stop. While Lisa was busy caring for her husband and children, she kept the world laughing with a following that includes celebs like Megan Trainer and Ross Matthews. Hell hath no fury like a class mom text, okay? This text is lit all night long. You ever need anybody to talk to, ask what shirt we got to wear the next day because this text is lit all night long. And so you call your fans, the people, your followers. I don't have fans. They're my friends. I got an invitation in the mail. Pick what you're going to eat. I don't know what I'm going to eat tonight. I got to tell you in June of 2026 if I'm going to want salmon or chicken. <laughs> I don't know what I want at that night. It was her friends who kept her strong during her darkest hours. Let's talk a little bit about your husband. Describe him for me. Wonderful man, uh, great dad. He took a big piece of everybody's heart. This past spring, her husband lost his battle to cancer at the age of 40. In my experience, it's almost impossible to quantify the helplessness you feel as the spouse. And like, it seems like you did so much for your family and for him. He did more for us. He did. And you fought through laughter. We did. I found for myself a healthy vice. It's healthy. I wasn't hurting anybody. It was a beautiful distraction. You can't live in it all the time because it'll eat you up alive. This single parent finds herself embarking on a whole new career, stand-up comedy, grown out of her popular Instagram account. Listen to me, how I ended up here, I have no idea. None. I am not a comedian. I don't know what I am, but there are no refunds, so you're stuck here. <laughs> I got back on for a number of reasons. There's a paycheck that comes out of every one of these shows. <laughs> There's a reality to that. A you're now a single mom. Yes. I come to see all my friends. These people have been there for me. They don't even know me. That's what they are. They've been through there with me through the good, the bad, the ugly. It's part of the healing process. Yeah. She hits the nail on the head for everything that she says, and she just puts light into my life. You know when you're on the weekend and you feel like motivated to do something? <laughs> I joined the gym online. I forgot that I joined the gym online. We've got somebody else who wants to say hello. Hold oh. on. Hi, Lisa Marie. It's Fortune Feimster. Uh, and I know that you've gotten into stand-up, and I, I uh, love that you're out there just uh, I love her. making people laugh and filling the world with positivity. Oh I know my you've gosh. been going through a lot, um, so I really admire you for what you've done. Oh, my gosh. I think that that is so wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, you That's know so what? Amazing. This is even more amazing. They want you to open for her. No way! Are you <laughs> kidding me? <gasps> oh my god, that's crazy! Right? Gal? It's your time. Oh my god, that's insane!
Welcome back to The Boost. We've got one more story for you, and it'll leave you with a smile. Here's a moment one groom is never going to forget. So just one day before his wedding, family members told him there was a surprise waiting for him in the basement. What he would soon find out was it was actually his dad, who flew in from Europe after initially saying he was not going to be able to make it. Take a look. No way. No way. Oh, I said you didn't think I was going to miss it, did you? That is it for today. We hope we're able to start your day off with a little positivity and hopefully a big smile. And guess what? We will see you right here tomorrow with more of The Boost right here on Today All Day. Do you ever just look around and say, I can't believe we did this? Yes, totally. That was like the light bulb moment. I got up there and I just said I quit my job and started this company. And I just kept going. It was a lot of testing and learning. There's been a lot of tears along the way. We can actually change the world. When did you have the moment, I made it, I did it? Hi everyone and welcome to another edition of She Made It, where we highlight some amazing female founders who are shaking up their industries and turning their light bulb ideas into reality. For this half hour, I'll be telling you all about some of my favorite brands to help you look and feel your best, whether it's a cozy blanket to help us unwind or a unique way for gifting to those you love. We have got you covered. Plus, I'll reveal my She Made It It list featuring Four small businesses you'll want to shop, all from dynamic women you'll want to support. So, let's get started. First up, I want to introduce you to Birdie Lashes, founder Yasmin Maya, an influencer who went from doing makeup tutorials to launching her own beauty brand. And she has overcome some incredible challenges on her path to success. Take a look. Influencer Yasmin Maya has over 3 million followers glued to her makeup and hair tutorials. Hey my beauties, welcome back to my channel. Bienvenidas a nuevo mi canal, yo soy... At 30 years old, the wife and mom with baby number two on the way. Aww, Go baby bump. <laughs> is also behind Birdie Lashes, the brand she officially launched last December with foam ink lashes and eyeliner that doubles as adhesive. What makes your lashes so easy because I know a lot of people are like, okay, it's another lash and I can't ever put them on myself. Our lashes are vegan, cruelty-free. They're super ultra soft and they're very light. So you're not gonna feel them heavy. You just pop it right on top of the eyeliner and it will stay. How proud are you of yourself? I look back and it's unbelievable. Hi guys. Okay, welcome to my channel. Nine years ago, Yasmin started her YouTube channel, Beauty Bird. She was living alone and in limbo. Not in the Southern California town where she was raised, but in her birth country. I'm going actually through a really hard time right now. Walk us through what your childhood was like and what you went through. I was born in Mexico, very poor, like almost homeless. I didn't move here to the United States until I was like a year and three months. I grew up thinking I was part of this country and it wasn't until I got to high school when my mom got deported that it hit me with the reality that I am actually an illegal immigrant. Yasmin's father, also not a U.S. citizen, was deported shortly after her graduation. I started realizing I'm not going to be able to apply for a job or even go to college and get scholarships. I was in fear of deportation. Then at 18, Yasmin boldly left the only place she had called home bound for Tijuana, hoping to find work until she could return without worry. It's not a life, honestly, to just live in fear. My boyfriend went after me and we ended up getting married. But her husband had to patiently wait for her in the States. Even her parents had legally returned to this side of the border. Yasmin was on her own for three years, waiting on her green card. Well, every day I would cry. <laughs> So how did you overcome that? I started watching YouTube videos, girls doing makeup, and my mom was like, why don't you give it a try? And I was like, you know what, you're right, I have nothing to lose. 
Short on cash, Yasmin receives a camera and cosmetics from her mother. But then she accidentally burned off her lashes while heating hot water for the shower. My little tiny eyelashes. I was so sad and it was like, no, I'm not gonna give up. I went out and bought my first false lashes. Is that incredible? Yeah. Finally, reuniting with her family in May of 2013, she continued to post and rake in ads and sponsorships, and a new dream emerged. I started to see more and more people saying, I unfortunately don't know how to apply lashes. She decided to develop an affordable false lash line for every eye shape. Whatever fiesta that you can think of, this is for you. Today, with close to 80,000 units of lashes sold and a multi-million dollar portfolio across all of her businesses, Yasmin feels her success as a Mexican Latina immigrant is especially poignant at this time. What I try to do is use my voice for other people that feel like they need to be quiet or ashamed of like where they're coming from. And so I take this month very serious to try and use it to our advantage and just be heard. Any dream is possible. We have some samples here. They're so easy to use. And after our She Made It segment, Yasmin told us that Birdie Lashes saw an incredible boost in sales and website engagement. Most recently, the brand launched their Wing It Mascara. It's their first ever mascara with a custom dual tip, and it's waterproof, too. We all love that. Yay, Birdie Lashes. All right, I love this next one, too. Katherine Hamm is an entrepreneur who built her Baraby business based on comfort, and today she's turned her homemade weighted blankets into a multi-million dollar brand. Growing up in Germany, it was normal to nap during the afternoon. And then once I moved here to the US, I realized that actually nobody is napping. I think it's almost frowned upon. Feel like you need a nap? Well, Catherine Ham has you covered. I mean, no one has a master's in blankets. So what was <laughs> your background? I used to be an economist at the World Bank. With the constant traveling, I just felt exhausted, not being able to sleep, waking up multiple times at night. It just really affects you and it affects your day. Back in 2016, Catherine researched products to help her sleep and came across weighted blankets. It was just a complete game changer for me. I slept like never before. The only problem I had with this blanket that it just made me really hot. It was filled with all these plastic beads. So it was noisy and I just realized there was no way that I could sleep under that blanket for an entire night. After getting nearly 50 no's from potential manufacturers, Catherine took matters into her own hands, enlisting her mom to knit her first prototype out of their garage. The blanket was heavy, it looked beautiful, and it felt cozy, calming, and most importantly, it didn't make me hot. So that's when I realized that we had created something really special. She called the business Baraby, a combination of the words bear hug and lullaby. Baraby officially launched online in December 2018 and sold out in two weeks. What was the turning point? Because you turned this into a multi-million dollar business. One morning I woke up and I had an email from West Elm in my inbox and they wanted to see our blankets and come to our New York showroom. And I mean, I almost broke down laughing because we didn't have a showroom at that time. We were just- Right, so, you're like, come to my garage and see my mother and I. I think I did what any entrepreneur would do at this stage. So how about we come to your place? So we borrowed a hotel trolley and we pushed the whole trolley with 300 pounds of blankets down the street to West Elm and they immediately loved them and they were ready to order. Baraby made over $21 million in revenue in 2020 and recently had a cameo in an iconic TV show. So we just launched in Nordstrom's Countrywide and if you happen to watch Sex in the City, you might have spotted our blankets on set. Yeah, we've been growing from two people. Wait, 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 uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. You just really like <laughs> blew over that. Tell us the scene, tell us how that happened. Cynthia Nixon has a blanket and she was directing that scene. So it's like a pinch wow. me moment because I'm a huge fan. And as CEO, Catherine is trying to create a dreamy office environment for Barabee's workforce. We work from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. 
And outside of these co-working hours, everyone can be flexible. Some people like to nap, some people like to walk their dogs, and other people like to spend time with their children. I assume that your employees respond well to that, just saying, if you get your work done whenever you can get it done, I want to encourage you to feel rested and healthy and inspire wellness. We don't have to earn rest. We actually need rest. I think it's a, it's it works wonders just to put 20 minutes on the calendar for a nap. For someone sitting at home who has an idea like this and who's not in the field they want to be in or has an idea about something that doesn't exist, what would be your best advice? Every business starts with an idea and it's more about the courage to take the first step doesn't that just make you want to curl up and take a good nap? Well, since Barabee's launch, the company has grown more than 5,000%. And in the spirit of Barabee's mission to create a calmer, more comforted world, this past spring, Barabee launched the Hug It, a sensory knot pillow that provides stylish stress relief. We could all use that. Okay, but don't go to sleep just yet because there's much more to come. Next, supermodel turned mogul Winnie Harlow shares her personal story of building her skincare line, plus how one woman is reinventing the ear piercing experience. We'll be right back. Welcome back to She Made It. Winnie Harlow is a groundbreaking supermodel in her own right. Here's a look how one of the biggest names in fashion took her talents from the runway to the sun care aisle. Take a look. I've been able to showcase everyone else's work, and the things that they've labored on, and now I get to do the same for myself. It's a dream come true. For years, Winnie Harlow has been blazing a trail in the fashion industry, but now she's making strides in business as well. After everything you've been through, and I know this goes back to childhood, how important is that title for you, entrepreneur? My mom is a hairdresser and she had her own salon. My dad is a mechanic in Jamaica and still runs his own shop. I was thinking, where do I get this from? And I was just like, wait, it's in my blood, you know? It, it's from my parents. As a child, Winnie was diagnosed with the skin condition, vitiligo. It's hard enough being a kid to begin with, but right. kids were so mean and saying names to you. Tell me about your childhood. When you're in a small town, especially as a young kid, it feels like that is the end all and be all. It seems like the end of the world, but it's really just the beginning of your life. After competing on America's Next Top Model, Winnie started making a name for herself on high fashion runways and at photo shoots for big brands. Walking Victoria's Secret was incredible for me, life-changing. A lot of people don't know this, but I did try out for Victoria's Secret the year before and I didn't get it. And so getting it the second time was amazing. Like any Vogue cover I'm on, I'm the first model with vitiligo to be on that cover. So that is mind blowing to me because I had never seen myself represented growing up. 
Winnie says in 2018, an incident on a set inspired her to take action. I had this horrible experience on set at a shoot where no one wanted me to apply sunscreen. It made my, my skin look purple and gray, and it wasn't great for the photo shoot. So, you know, I went without to get the best shots, but after two days of shooting from sun up to sun down in the Bahamas, I was burnt to a crisp. I was like in so much pain. I had to have doctors give me injections for, for pain, for inflammation. And I realized that there wasn't sun care on the market that made you look gorgeous and also be well protected. Winnie got to work developing skincare products. I think people think you're a supermodel, things just, you know, you just, you get a line and it doesn't work like that. I had no idea where to start. I had the idea, like it's my brainchild, but I had no business savvy. I think some of the most challenging things for me were one, hearing all those no's when we were, when we started fundraising, especially being a business that was created in a pandemic where things were already being pushed back with packaging and the formulas and like our factories shutting down for COVID. And, you know, there were so many steps back every time we were taking steps forward. Nearly three years later, Winnie raised $6.5 million from investors to launch K-Skin, a sun care line inspired by the beaches of her family Family's native Jamaica. I wanted to put things that I've used since I was a kid going to Jamaica and staying with my dad. They used to cut the aloe vera plant and rub it directly onto our skin for like mosquito bites or sunburns. We also have hydrating nectar, which is from different fruits and botanicals. Winnie hopes to inspire people to take care of and to love the skin they're in. What would you say as advice to young girls out there who are going through a tough time? who just like want to get through it and pursue her dream. I would say focus on yourself. There's only two things that you can really do in life. You can change things and those things that you can't change, you got to move forward. Well, after we talked to Winnie for She Made It, the K-Skin team told us that K-Skin sales more than doubled. They've also expanded the line to include non-SPF lip and body care products, just the perfect pampering we need for fall and winter. Congratulations, Winnie. Great, great girl. Well, next up, a woman who is shaking up the piercing business. Rowan founder Louisa Schneider made it a point to create safe, hygienic, and fun piercing experiences for first-timers and those looking to get in on the ear party trend. Do your work, do your research, and don't let anyone make you feel like your idea is small. Because if you're passionate about it and you know that it resonates with other people, you were probably onto something. For entrepreneur Louisa Schneider, First-time ear piercing should not look like this scene from the hit movie Grease. No! Oh. And I desperately wanted an option that I knew would be safe, but that would also be joyful. And so that was really when I started thinking about why didn't that concept exist already? Louisa launched Rowan in 2018, a company looking to turn this sometimes ignored rite of passage into an experience worthy of a special celebration. To me, as a mom and as a woman, it was so clear that ear piercing is a milestone. And I was amazed that it had not been really modernized. So tell me how this idea started. I knew that even though malls were really suffering, one concept that continued to drive foot traffic was mall-based piercers. And around the time that my daughter was born, I took my nieces to get their ears pierced. And it wasn't a great experience. <laughs> The concept was pretty crowded and cluttered and tired. And I realized at that time that I would never take my daughter there. That's when Louisa started Rowan, a concierge ear piercing and subscription box service where customers could book a licensed nurse to perform piercings in the comfort of their own home. What was your first step? We started with a small proof of concept. So two nurses that were able to do a number of house calls and for us at Rowan, one of the most important things is thinking about the full experience. You may end up with an infection, and that is something that we want to avoid. The business quickly grew. Louisa then opened Rowan's first piercing studio in New York City, coincidentally just half a block away from a big box store that would play a major part in the next step of their journey. I got reached out to on LinkedIn, and the person who was reaching out to me had a Target address. And I did not think it was real. So I actually ignored it for a few weeks. And then there was another persistent outreach. And I thought, 
well, there is a chance this is real. So I'm going to take the call. Target offered Rowan the opportunity to open full service piercing studios in stores across California. I love it. But the pandemic brought on new challenges for the company. The thought of having an intimate moment, piercing an ear during COVID was really uncertain. But as people became more knowledgeable about COVID and about safety protocol, there was this imprint of wanting a sterile environment. Rowan nurses are now in more than 200 Target locations across the country. They've also opened a second standalone piercing studio, this time in Connecticut, and pierce as many as 20,000 ears a month. What do you think getting your ears pierced energetically represents? We say at Rowan, every piercing is a milestone and every milestone can be celebrated with a piercing. It's really a liberating form of self-expression. So doing it safely and having fun is really, you know, what it's all about. After our She Made It show, Rowan tells us they've since opened up nine studios across the country. And this month they are opening a location in Charlotte, North Carolina, and their very first mall location at the Mall of America. And it doesn't stop there. Chicago, Boston, and Miami, look out for a Rowan coming to you. I love hearing that. Well, up next, hear about women who made their dreams a reality from a female founder who is taking gifting to a whole new level and to a woman who's showing us that her business is on a roll. That's all coming up next. Welcome back to our She Made It special focused on pampering and getting ready for the holidays. You're about to meet the entrepreneurs behind innovative companies who are helping us make our lives a little bit easier. First up, Toki founder Jane Park, who is putting a creative spin on gift giving. Take a look. My parents and I immigrated from Korea when I was four. We lived above their convenience store and I did my homework behind the cash register. I loved having a front row seat to their courage and resilience. Even though I went to law school, my passion for New Horizons pulled me into entrepreneurship. I took a leap to start my first business, a beauty tech startup in 2007. I raised millions of dollars and sold it for even more. A few years ago at Christmas, I was throwing out bags and bags of used gift wrap because most of it wasn't recyclable. I thought about how my Korean grandmother would wrap gifts in squares of cloth, which we saved to reuse again and again. So I got to work reinventing gift wrap to make it more sustainable with the digital twist by inventing a QR gift tag, which allows you to show up with your gift by uploading a photo or video. 
Toki means rabbit in Korean. And my hope is that our products will hop from friend to friend and celebration to celebration. Well, since our She Made It segment, Toki is now nationwide. And check this out. This summer, they just launched their latest product line, the Toki Eco Gifting Set. This line uses recycled water bottles to further reduce our emissions. And guess what? With every order of their Eco Gifting Set, Toki is giving viewers free additional bags, all with free shipping. Well, moving on to brand number two now, that's actually the name. Number two, founded by a woman who is wiping away the competition while saving the planet at the same time. Take a look. My name is Samira Farr, and to me, true luxury is living in a land plush with trees rather than cutting them down to make toilet paper. That's why I created number two, a stylish toilet paper that not only gives you a clean wipe, but also helps preserve our forests. In 2017, after selling my first business, I began to research the toilet paper industry. It felt outdated. I was shocked to find that TP can be made from alternative fibers like bamboo, and that there aren't a lot of brands that don't use plastic packaging. I also learned that bamboo can grow at a much faster rate than trees, making it a way more eco-friendly option. I launched number two toilet paper in 2019 and have grown from selling only online to selling from bigger home goods stores like Urban Outfitters and Lowe's Home Improvement. Customers love the strength and quality of the teepee, as well as the stylish patterns. But most importantly, they are thrilled to be saving the planet one wipe at a time. Love this. Well, number two is now introducing 100% bamboo paper towels and facial tissue. And they have exciting news. Early next year, number two is now becoming Rizzy Home and will continue to expand Band, its line of home goods. Congratulations to them. I use this and just love the packaging. How else can you give toilet paper as a gift? Well, there's still much more to come. Up next, it's our She Made It It list for women-owned small businesses that will help you feel your best this season. We'll be right back. Welcome back. I have even more extraordinary female founded brands that I'm so excited to share with you on my She Made It It list. Brand number one, Dogwood Hill. In 2014, founder Jennifer Hunt saw a gap in the market for online art-driven holiday cards, so she did something about it. Jennifer's mission was to create a website where customers could go for personalized cards that eliminated the lengthy design times and pricey design fees. So. Dogwood Hill was born. With its collective of over 30 artists, Dogwood Hill is able to supply products within 10 days that are unique and personalized for you and your families. What a great way to wrap a gift and beautiful quality. All right, brand number two, Clean Circle. Lena Chow launched her skincare reusable products that replace single-use makeup wipes and cotton rounds. As the first-generation daughter whose mom worked as a seamstress, Lena knew the ins and outs of the textile industry and set out to create beauty reusables with certified clean fabrics. Clean Circle's mission is to reduce beauty waste 
all while protecting your skin from environmental stressors. These are great. Brand three, Palermo Body. Jessica Morelli is the founder and formulator of the skincare line that is all about nourishing the skin and stimulating the mind. At an early age, Jessica was inspired by the natural skincare practices of her Sicilian grandmother. Their revitalizing body scrub has become a favorite among customers, and just recently, Palermo Body launched their breast cancer initiative, donating $5 of every purchase of the scrub to breast cancer research. Such an unbelievable cause and really, really great products. All right, last up, Lucky 13 Candles. Lawyer and founder Amina Mack started her massage oil candle company in 2019 to connect her with her then fiance and now husband. Guess it worked. So she taught herself how to make candles that turn into massage oils with all natural ingredients. Amina reports that the connection with her husband is stronger than ever, and Lucky 13 Candles will be getting into retail stores early next year. Just love this. Well, that's all for our She Made It today. Thanks so much for watching, and remember to shop these small businesses, scan the QR code at the bottom of the screen, or head over to today.com slash shop. I'm Joel Martin. I'm so excited you watched the show. Such great entrepreneurs, and we'll see you next time. Joining us this morning, Kevin Curry, chef, author, and fit man cook. He's here to share a delicious dinner idea that won't break the budget. Beef and broccoli, I mean, takeout is always a crowd favorite. So this is a no sugar added beef and broccoli dish. So here is some lean flank steak. If okay. you are a part of the plant-based crew, then just use some mushrooms okay. or some chicken. So what we're gonna do first is just sprinkle in a little bit of this cornstarch. All right. And this is gonna help it to get really nice and crispy, but it's also gonna help the sauce to adhere to the beef. All right. All right, you're gonna mix that together together for us. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. And so once you mix it up, you're going to get your wok super like piping hot and then add in the beef. Now, this is the most Any important oil part. Any oil um, You know, I, I like to use a little bit of avocado oil, okay. but vegetable oil is great too. All right. So you're going to get this nice and hot. And then once you will know it's ready to flip once it easily comes ah, off of pro tip. the pan. Yes. Okay. That is the pro tip. Now, we're going to move over here um, and you're going to cut up some bell pepper and some um, broccoli. So Top off the top, uh -huh. the bottom, and then side, and then just roll wow. your knife on the inside oh, of it, just like that. Isn't that cool? Yeah. And look, it just comes right out so easily. Yeah. And then just easily chop this into chunks, okay. and everything can be really nice and uniform. And that's gonna go in your yes. scallion. Yes, we're gonna add in some broccoli, bell pepper. Just imagine that's what we have right here. Okay. Okay, okay let me just chop off the top of it okay. for us. There we go. Chop off the broccoli and then add this to there. Now, inside here, we have a little bit of garlic and also some green onion. This is the- Garlic and green onion, yes, got it. Yes, this is the aroma part. How long now, is that gonna cook, This chef? is gonna cook for about two to three minutes. Now for the broth. We have chicken broth mm -hmm. here. You can use some beef broth if you want. A little bit of low sodium soy. Low sodium, Now, this is cornstarch. Why, correct, this is why, here's a cornstarch. And to replace you know, the sugar, we are using ginger. Ginger's got a really nice peppery Ooh. and spicy flavor. Okay. You won't miss it. Mix this together. We're gonna add the beef back beef to our wok here. Okay. Boom. And then the sauce goes in as well. The sauce goes in. It's gonna get really nice and slushy in here. Let's get now, down to the okay. tasting area because you're garnishing. Boom. What are you garnishing that with? This is some sesame seeds, and you can toast these. You can also use some black ones if if you're fancy. Mm. Mm. What's the so, verdict, so, folks? Yeah. Delicious. Okay. A lot of good. Chef. Yeah. Mm -hmm. good. And it's right. and again to your point, cheaper and healthier. It's cheaper. This meal comes out to less than five dollars per meal. Wow. wow. For okay. four That's servings. That's great. Chef, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chef. <laughs> Made dinner for the Melvin House tonight.
Welcome back. Oh, something's smelling good this morning on Today Food. Chef, author, and certified nutritionist Nia Rigdon is here to help us stick to our healthy New Year's resolutions. These are two easy veggie packed dinner recipes. It's from her new cookbook called Food Wise. Mia, good morning. Thanks for having me. Okay, I usually don't get excited when there's vegetables, but this looks and smells delicious. What are oh, we making? Well, thank you. So first we're gonna start with a super green spaghetti okay. with zucchini noodles. So have you ever used a spiralizer before? I've seen them, I've never attempted right, so it. So you just kinda give it a whirl here. Okay. You wanna give that a try? Yeah, now you need the spiralizer, I guess, yeah, if you wanna you need do this the recipe. You know, now a lot of grocery stores have pre-made zucchini oh, noodles, true, which can cut down on time. But I like to use the spiralizer. And then we're also going to use the zucchini to make a really creamy zucchini pesto. Okay. So I've already got a clove of garlic in here. Yeah. I'm going to dump in this diced zucchini. I'll you can spiralize use, like the okay. leftover little nubs from that as well. Oh, okay. We've got olive oil, mm -hmm. lemon juice, this is a dairy-free pesto, oh, and it's yeah. not a chunky pesto. This is really creamy, and the zucchini okay. is adding some extra nutrients. Is that pine nuts you just put yeah, in there? Yeah, some okay, toasted yeah. pine nuts and some basil. All We're right. not going to blend this because it's loud. Okay. And so over we'll pretend here, to blend. over here, we've got our pasta going. So the thing I like about this recipe mm -hmm. is that it has both. Mm. Zucchini noodles and pasta. Oh, I was just oh, noticing oh, that. Oh, so it's not just good. zucchini noodles. Uh, so, but let's just say you that wanted to go all zucchini noodles. You could noodles. totally go all okay. zucchini noodles. You could also That's go all like pasta. Yeah. Okay. So well, what I like pasta. about this is that when I'm making a pasta dish, and I talk about this a lot in the book, yeah. it's all about inverting the ratio. Because normally when you have pasta, it's like 90% pasta with like yeah. some sauce on it. Right. So then you're only eating carbs. Correct. Here we've got, we're using a chickpea pasta, which is high protein. It's got lots of fiber, and okay. then we're cutting the portion in half. Okay. So that so you're more zucchini than pasta. More zucchini, and this is also a high protein pasta. But you could serve this with chicken, fish. It looks incredible, guys. How does it it's taste? Really, it really it checks. You the like box. it? The chickpea pasta is a great call. We the, use that now at the house as well. Yep, the chickpea mm -hmm. pasta is great. More protein. This is better for your Bonds blood sugar yeah. levels. No, more fiber. And you just put the blended stuff really right in there. Yep. Oh my gosh, I can't just wait to blend taste it up. that. I'm gonna eat what and stir. I'm stirring. All right. Okay. okay. Moving on to the next recipe. Looking great, SG. Looking great. All right. <laughs> we are making spicy broccoli poppers. Yum. I make these with my son all the time. Okay. Super easy. So what I've done here is we've mixed together just some water, some flour. I'm using a gluten-free all-purpose flour, but you okay. can use regular flour mm -hmm. and some sunflower seeds. And then you just dip the broccoli in there one by one, and then you're going to put them onto a sheet pan once okay. they're all dipped. You bake this in the oven for 10 minutes. Bake and not fry. Yes, bake okay. in the oven for 10 minutes. This is like my take on like a broccoli tempura. Yeah. And then they're going to come out like this, and then we mix together the sauce. Okay. So this is some white miso paste I have here. Mm -hmm. Some chili flakes. If you're making this with kids, my son Ozzy loves this. Okay. I just, he's three, so I leave out the chili flakes, but it's a fun way to prepare <laughs> yeah. broccoli. We've got some tamari mm -hmm. and some coconut aminos. Okay. Some lime juice. Right. Is that wow. Coconut what? Coconut aminos. It's like a soy free. Are these uh, hard to find these items? What is no. the tamari? What's that? Tamari is tamari. a gluten free. Close enough. Tomorrow oh. is a gluten free soy sauce. So you could oh. also use mm. soy sauce here, okay. but I prefer tamari. All the recipes in my book are gluten free. Oh, okay, great. So then you're just going to want to whisk this up. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we're going to have a five alarm fire here. Oh. Just turn is it this whole meal gluten free? Everything is gluten free. Right gluten free. I've never had a gluten free meal until right now. Ever? Oh, really? Yeah. All right. Well, welcome. Well, how do you like it? Egg. Did you try the broccoli? Does it give it's you that fantastic. kind of yeah. like tempura feel? I feel like you could almost temp any vegetable you could tempura. Yes. Like the zucchini totally. or you yeah. cauliflower, any, you could do with this. You could even throw some chicken in here. If you wanted to, could you deep fry that? You could, or you could also use an air fryer. Oh, there you go. You could order yeah. pizza okay. too, Al. There you go. <laughs> but, it's a but realm a, of a vegan pizza. <laughs> Yes. You could order pizza. pizza. One of those okay, of cool. Pizza. So yeah, once, we whisk that up once and then this what? is all whisked up, then we're going to throw the broccoli that we baked yes. in here. Okay. Do you wait after. for it to cool or just go right in? Yeah, it depends if you don't, don't want to burn your fingers. You right. Well, wait for it that. to cool. Oh, cool. Yes. But, you know. And then we just mix it up, okay. and then we throw it back on the sheet pan. We bake it for another 10 oh, minutes, oh. and then we stick the broiler on to, to get them nice and crispy Ooh. like they are here. And yeah. What about air voila. fryer? Could you put that in the air fryer? She just totally put it in the air fryer. That's okay. Yeah. 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 Like the air seconds. fryer right. is a little go? bit quicker. I missed that. Where yeah, were you? That was like 20 seconds ago. It was the lack of gluten. Did, did, <laughs> did you take a little trip? I did. I did. But I'm back now. This has got a nice little bite to it, by the way. The broccoli? It's got a little bite. 
Yeah. So that's, that's, that's there's no substitute for flavor here. It's really no, it's really good. That's what we're going for. Mia, thank you so much. Congrats on the cook at the end of a long week. Let's face it, you barely have any energy left to cook, so it's good to have a go-to dish you can whip up pretty quickly. We got you covered, Josh. Mama Clay is a chef instructor and teaches on Milk Street TV. He's going to show us his basil broccoli pasta. I, I just tiptoed through that one, Josh. I'm glad I got you it. You did great. Thank you, honey. Tell us, tell us about what we're making. So essentially what we're making is a broccoli pesto, and it starts with two pounds of broccoli. Now, more often than not, you will be able to get broccoli florets in just the big bags, but if you end up working with a large crown, yeah. cutting it down is actually super, super simple, and I'm not even going to look at it. No, wait. Oh, no. wow. Okay, oh, now you're showing no. off. That's a pro tip. I am showing off a little bit. That's a pro tip. But the reason why I cut it down into steaks like that is because I'm getting this really, really fantastic, mm -hmm. like, flat surface yeah. area. And that is going to make direct contact with my pan. And therefore, when it roasts in an oven at 400 degrees Fahrenheit, mm -hmm. it's going to get a really nice brown on it. Okay. And that's going to develop a really beautiful, savory flavor. Okay. But you want to go ahead and just discard any of the stems. You don't need those for this recipe. Mm -hmm. Okay. But... Break your broccoli florets down into one and a half inch pieces. Again, you don't have to be particularly careful about this. Mm -hmm. But all you're going to do is bring all of that broccoli together in yeah. a bowl, Beautiful. along with two teaspoons, actually, yeah, two teaspoons of regular like vegetable oil. Okay. Any neutral oil, avocado oil will work. And you're also going to follow that up with a little bit of salt. Okay. okay. So I believe it's two tablespoons and one teaspoon of salt in here. Okay. We're going to just give that a little toss. And then we're going to go ahead and arrange that on our sheet here. I have a baking sheet lined with tin foil. I'm just going to dump it right on out. Beautiful. And here's my little pro tip. You want to make sure that you're putting everything cut side down. Okay. That way, all of cut that flat down. surface wow. area Smart. that you yeah. established, that's going to get really, really nicely seared in the oven. Okay. So once you get that nice and arranged... You throw it in the oven, simple as that. So again, awesome. 400 degrees Fahrenheit, uh -huh. and I already have one that is working in there. So we'll take a peek at Look that at your one little later. mitt. That's a cute, the <laughs> cutest little oven mitt. <laughs> Thank you. I've never, yeah, no, I have so these big, big like sausage I patty would, hands. I love that. So when right you're size. working with like, it is the right size. It makes things a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Now, while that's roasting off in the oven, we could go ahead and take a look at our pot here. here I actually have a large pot set up with six cups of water. Now, six cups is not typically what you would cook pasta in. Right. Um, but we're cooking in less water here on purpose, so that way we develop a lot of starches. Yeah. Uh, right. That's going to help this sauce get really luscious. Okay, we and only have a minute pasta. left, so will you yeah. just help Ooh, us? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Totally, totally. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and blanch our basil. basil. That only takes about five uh -huh. seconds. And this is the same water that we would cook the pasta in. Okay. Like I said, we blanch it for five seconds, uh -huh. and then we throw it into an ice bath. This step is totally optional, but it really helps the sauce maintain its bright green color. Okay, okay. Got so it. once we get that in there, All right. we'll go ahead and fish that out, and we'll blend it up. Okay. So, so you hit it, you put it in the little food processor, and you add it. Like and like you, you add you add to it oil. So yep, here we have our food processor. I'm just going to throw my basil right on in. If a little bit of water makes its way in, that's no problem. But you'll hit that with a quarter cup of olive oil, uh -huh. right. along with a quarter cup of grated Parmesan cheese, mm -hmm. Yum. two cloves of garlic that have been yep. roughly chopped, and my secret ingredient here, we have some capers. Oh, I now, love that's going capers. To really nice. Yeah, they're okay. really, really right. fantastic. So after you yeah. grind that up and just put that right over the pasta? And some lemon. Yeah, we're also going nice. to throw in a little bit of lemon juice. And if you have time, uh -huh. you can go always uh, throw in lemon juice. All right, Josh, why don't you we'll show us the finished place. product? Because we got to rock. Ah, you got it. So we're going to bring that together right before your very eyes. Beautiful. Show us so, what you got. Show us what you got, Josh. Beautiful. Josh, thank you so much. That looks really delish. We appreciate that. Absolutely. For that, for that recipe, go to today.com slash food. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Josh. You got it. Thank you.
It's not only cheesy and comforting, it's also got some great color too. I love it. Missy Robbins is a James Beard Award winning chef and owner of Lilia and Missy Restaurants. She's out with her second book called Pasta, the Spirit and Craft of Italy's Greatest Food. Missy's right here near us in Brooklyn uh -huh. in her kitchen right now. Missy, by the way, you were a home run on the eight o'clock hour. We're still talking about that breakfast pasta. Oh, we get uh -huh. it. No, we want it. We want <laughs> you to come make it for us. But for us, you're going to make. I will do that anytime I'm allowed. Yay. I love it. Okay, so you're making a broccoli pesto. This mm -hmm. is one of your favorites. Tell us why. Yeah, this one. This one's a little later than the last segment where we did carbonara, and I, I, I bragged about how rich it is. Okay. This one's a little later. Um, there's a few reasons I love this. One, it's it's got broccoli. It's healthy. It's I developed this when when I was trying to eat healthier and wanted to include more vegetables and okay. how do I do that but still have a little pasta so it starts with it starts with you can use broccoli you can use broccoli rob in my in my recipe I have both um, you kind of just separate the florets the mm -hmm. leaves and then um, blanch it shock it chop it so that's a, a, just a quick cook um, and you end up with this um, and then the leaves and basil you also mm. blanch and do a puree okay. um, and then we use pecorino we mm. use Parmigiano. So it's still so got the yummy the stuff in there. So all the kind of traditional, yeah, yeah, all the yummy stuff. Yeah. It's not, it's not, it's not like, you Can know, Can I ask diet. real quick about it's, that it's, pesto you, was that a pesto you poured in? Is that what the basil was? That, that was, that was just a puree. Puree, um, okay. And then this is olive oil, which will mm. kind of bind it all together. Mm. And then the gnocchi, one of the reasons I love them, I think, I think, A, you can make them ahead of time. You can, you can make them, you can cook them ahead of time and hold them overnight. This is a ricotta gnocchi Ooh. that's uh, really foolproof. Yeah. Like you, you cannot screw this up. So and, should you just and, not buy the, uh, you know, the frozen okay. ones? And do I need you to do the real thing? You should never buy. Never, is that ever, horrible ever. of me? Okay, I'm sorry. Ever. I won't buy the frozen ones anymore. I mean, this is just so easy, and I, I love it also because it's great to make with kits. Mm. Really great to make with kits. It's an easy one. Um, I roll this dough out into ropes, you see, uh -huh. and then I cut them into pieces mm. and then if you want a little extra fancy you go um you want to make sure there's enough flour so they don't stick the stove can mm -hmm. get a little sticky and we have this little paddle very traditional uh -huh. gnocchi board um and you just kind of roll it down uh -huh. like this uh -huh. also like really fun for kids like great roll hand eye it. coordination uh -huh. um oh and I know and once, you, uh, once you taste those, you probably can't go back. So I guess I can see that. Exactly. And, then, <laughs> and they're just easier than potato gnocchi. So I have them cooking in back. It's really hard. Like with traditional pasta, egg pasta, it's so delicate. It's pretty hard to screw these guys up. <laughs> like they, you want to cook them till they float to the top. But if they float and they cook another one or two minutes, you're okay. You're going to end up with something very, very light. That's okay. the other thing with these. There's a lot of cheese. Um, I have my broccoli pesto on the Oof. stove here. Um, Yum. And and just and and it's got a little pasta water to loosen it up. So mm -hmm. pasta water is a really important ingredient when you're making pasta. It adds starch. It adds a little salt. And we just go right in the pan here. Coat it. Right and then how do you know when it's ready? Well, you're gonna marry them together. Okay. So you're gonna just toss, 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 mm. toss, mm. toss. Until those gnocchi kind of absorb into into the uh, sauce, and the sauce absorbs into the gnocchi, Look and they become one. I was just gonna say mine would be all over the floor. I'm just mesmerized. So, right I now. mean, you should try it at home. We, yeah. you know, when we teach young cooks, we tell them to take beans home and <laughs> and just flip beans okay. forever and ever. Oh. Um, and then we just go right here. Serve it up. Um, for the, Look for at the that. Final plate. Oh my gosh, I just want a fork right um, now. Mm. And these these gnocchi, you know, in the in the book we have. Um, tons of recipes for different red sauces. The, that's like one of my favorite things in the world to eat. Missy. Is, is just red sauce gnocchi. Missy, um, that is, a that's tart. a 10 plus. Look at that, Yum. a little more parm. Mm. We, thank you so much, um, and we're so excited thank again. You. You're joining us from your Brooklyn kitchen, but you've got, you're the owner of Lilia and Missy, the Missy. restaurants in New York. So thanks again. Yeah, uh, I hope to see you guys soon. Us too. For this recipe, go to today.com slash food. And for Missy's book, you can head to today.com slash shop. It's Thank called pasta. Thank you so much.
Welcome back for this week's Cooking with Cal. Pasta and a great cause. They're both on the menu, and this dinner did not disappoint. It's another edition of Cooking with Cal. What are we making today? Chickpea broccoli pasta. Yes! So this recipe actually comes from the Serving New York cookbook. Uh, a lot of chefs have put their recipes in here, and we are making Mark Meyer from Cook Shop his broccoli and chickpea pasta. So uh, It's a little one. It is a little one. Break it in half. I need you to make this even smaller, because could you eat this in one bite? I guess you could eat some of it. How do you like uncooked broccoli? So here's what I need you to do. Mm -hmm. You see these little broccolis? Mm -hmm. Can you start breaking that apart? These are all small enough, right? Yeah. Yeah, I just break it. Okay, so you don't like raw broccoli, right? So we gotta cook it. I'm gonna put these in boiling water. Nice. So let's add some olive oil. Let's put the lemon in. Do it. Just do a little salt and pepper. I'm sure then you're taller. See, I'm the So tall people do salt? Yeah. Short people do pepper? No, I don't do it. Now we're going to set this here. Before we slice the garlic, we're going to put the pasta in the water. I'm going to eat raw pasta. Just one. Oh, it's too hard. Look how hard it is. You remember what to do? Oh, you do. Good job. Just enough to get the skin off. Yeah. I did it. Awesome. Look at my nose. It's really sharp. When they're raw, they're spicy, but we're going to cook them. <laughs> Did you put your finger in your mouth? Yeah. What did I tell you? Can you wash my hands so they don't be spicy? Yes, as soon as we're done with this, okay? I'm going to add some cheese. Ooh, we got to shred some cheese. Okay. Oh, we need a whole cup of grated cheese. That's going to take forever. It's <laughs> like tonight. <laughs> I hope it's done in time for dinner. Now I'm sweating. I hate grating cheese. I mean, I don't like grating cheese. Um, uh, it's the bad one. I know, I'm sorry. I think we're done. And more oil. Sprinkle it all over. I like this one. Is it hot? I'm gonna blow it for you. Yummy, yummy. Good job, bud. I love a dinner also that can feed everybody. Because yeah. Oliver, if you cut it up small enough, he's, there you go. he's enjoying it. And hate is a bad word, Mommy. Hate is a bad word. <laughs> Catch myself all day long. Not that I hate that many things. Right. I just, right. I don't like things. Never mind. Um, <laughs> you can find the recipe at today.com slash food. And by the way, both the digital and hard copy versions of Serving New York benefit a restaurant worker relief fund. The book has raised more than $200,000 so far. That's fantastic. Ah, uh, this morning on Today Food, dinner recipes that cut the carbs. And Chef Richard Ingram knows about eating well to win. In fact, he knows so much about it, he wrote a book about it. Yes. By the way, the chef, for almost two decades, has been the personal chef to NBA legend Dwayne Wade and his superstar wife, actress Gabrielle Union, one of our favorite celebrity couples here at the show, yes. by the way. This morning, the chef is here this morning to share a recipe straight from their kitchen. I was asking yeah. you during the commercial break if this is something you actually cook for, and you said yes. this, this is a go-to. It's a definitely a go-to dish. So a lot of folks in January, they make this commitment to start eating clean, to eat healthy, to eat right. right. What are some things that folks should remember when they're trying to do that? Well, when you're trying to eat healthier, one thing that you want to remember is that portion size is awesome, okay. you know? Portion size, everything in moderation, drink a lot of water, and it's when you eat certain things. So I would eat your carbs earlier in the day so that they can help you burn throughout the day and then slack off on the carbs late at night. Before we get into it, Sean, come a little closer because I want the audience to see. This is what you get for Christmas when you work for D. Wade. 
Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Nice. It gives you a championship. Nice. Right? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's, that's, yeah. good. that's good. Yeah. All right. So this morning we're going to go with uh, so sea bass in broccoli. Right. So what we have here is a miso roasted sea bass. So what we have here is brown sugar and miso. Okay. Mm. Okay. We have a little bit of ponzu that we're going to add in here. Ponzu is actually a fortified uh, soy sauce. Okay. So it has a little bit of uh, citrus in it. Here we have ginger juice. Now, if you can't find ginger juice, if you don't want to make your own, Another great substitute is to go and get that uh, that pickled ginger. Pickled ginger. Uh-huh. Yeah. And you can use that juice. Mm. Here we have marin, which is a sweet uh, rice wine. And then we have some sake here. Oh, right? sake. Ooh. Okay. Take a little shot. Then there you put the rest you, Exactly. Okay. Right? So we put that in and we stir it around just like so. Okay, to make our marinade. How long are you going to let the sea bass marinate? Now, you can you can marinate this from anywhere from two hours to overnight. Okay. Mm. Okay. The longer you let it marinate, then of course the more flavor that you're gonna get in it. Okay. So okay. now we'll take our marinade, put it right over our sea bass, just mm. like so. And if you don't like sea bass, if you wanna swap it out. No, if you want to swap it out, you can do salmon with it. You can do cod with it if you want to yeah. as well. But as Hoda pointed out, why would you? Right, why would yes. you do that? Now, if you don't have one of these dishes, and what I like to do as well is to put my sea bass in the bag mm. with the marinade, and then you can kind of smush it around. Oh, there you go. Mm. Right, yeah. right. So we've let it marinate. Now uh -huh. we're going to throw it on the grill. How so, long on each side? Now, what you do is you take your sea bass with your tongs, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, if you can get them working. Okay, and then you take and you go ahead and put it right on your grill, okay. just like so. About, uh, maybe about two minutes on two each minutes. side. Right? Quack, quack. Is there a way that you know it's done? Now, the way that you know it is done is if it turns opaque, which is a nice color, mm -hmm. or it starts to flake. But if you don't want to ruin it, what you do is you could take a thermometer mm -hmm. and stick it right in. Now, if it goes all the way in through, yeah. then it's done. Okay. If you oh, feel a little resistance, oh. then oh, it's not easy. done. Right? So our sea bass oh, is done. Let's Ours talk is about almost this. done, speaking of done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you use regular broccoli or do you use the broccolini? So now, nah, I use broccoli rob in the recipe, but you can use broccolini. Now, the difference is your broccoli rob is actually uh, in the turnip family, whereas oh. your broccolini and your broccoli is on the cabbage side. 30 seconds okay? left. So. All right. So now, what you would do is you would take your broccoli, you would put it in your water here, and what you're doing is you're, uh, you're shocking it. Uh -huh. You take it out of the boiling water, put it in here to stop the cooking process, to carry over cooking. Then blanch it. And then you're blanching it, uh -huh. right? So then you come here, put it right inside of your pan, you add a little bit of your garlic, you add some ginger. Uh, you add a little bit of your red pepper what's the flake. Word of guys? What you think over there? Okay. Right? We have happy plates. So. Good. Right, it's clean plate club. Saute it up a little bit. And that's it. That's, that's it. That's fairly easy, chef. It is. And then you, you just plate it up just like so. Beautiful. And then you have a little bit of your marinade left over. On and top. there you go. Chef Richard, thank you. Good morning and welcome to The Boost. It is that time of year again. We're talking about the holiday season and here in New York, nothing brings in the festive spirit like the iconic Rockefeller Center Christmas tree. We followed its journey from upstate New York to right here on our plaza. Joe Fryer shares the fun story behind this year's symbol of the season. When Matt and Jackie McGinley moved into their Vestal New York home in 2019, they paid little attention to the giant tree towering over their driveway. We had a whole punch list of things that needed to get repaired, things that we wanted to update or remodel, and frankly, the tree was just kind of in the background. But someone else did take notice, Rockefeller Center's head gardener, Eric Pause. In pulls a car, a uh, guy gets out, my name is Eric. I'm the head gardener from Rockefeller Center. I'm here to look at your tree. And I was like, no. <laughs> Do you like understand how crazy you sound right now? They couldn't have known Pase is a Rockefeller Christmas tree legend, having personally discovered each tree for the last 30 years. I Googled him and realized, and I quickly texted Matt, this is legitimate. We thought they were dating a lot of other trees, that maybe ours would be considered. And then as the date got closer and closer, we realized that, in fact, we 
probably did have the Rockefeller Center tree. The Beginleys knew they wanted to be part of this special tradition. And donating the tree, they hope it brings joy during a busy and sometimes emotional season. This is not about us, but it's about being of service to other people, giving them that chance to go and make memories by the tree. And for those like us who've had loss, to go back to that space and remember the people that they love. The McGinleys will be remembering Matt's mother, who passed away four years ago. I think she would think it was the coolest thing. Like I keep having this feeling of like, who am I not telling about this? There's somebody that, that I should be, that I feel like I ought to tell, and it's her, you know. Um, I was able to reach out to her best friend, and that person will be with us on the day of the cutting. The McGinley's two kids will be at the tree cutting too. Zoe, age 12, and Charlie, age nine, admit the hardest part of the whole process was keeping their tree's star status hidden until the official reveal. <laughs> I'm really bad at secrets, but I've been able to keep this one. <laughs> the tree stands 80 feet tall. It will arrive in this very spot this weekend with a full police escort, and it will become a part of New York history with 50,000 LED lights making it shine bright as a symbol of the holiday season. Three, two, one! Yeah! The deeply rooted tradition of the Rockefeller tree goes all the way back to 1931, when a Christmas tree was put up by the construction workers building Rock Center. Today, more than 100 million people visit the plaza each year to see the world famous tree. McGinley's say they're proud that tree from their own yard is playing a special role. Matt's mom used to always emphasize joy, and so that idea of joy in that space is really exciting. While the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree is a beloved holiday tradition, the Philadelphia Eagles are starting a new one. Members of the team are releasing their second Christmas album to support local charities. Chanel Jones sat down with some of the players to talk about their off-field talent. Take a look. Fireworks to begin. Will we have fireworks on the field tonight? Under bright lights in the city of brotherly love, two of the NFL's top teams, the Philadelphia Eagles and Miami Dolphins, squaring off overnight in a high-stakes showdown. Philly soaring to victory to move to 6-1, and one, tied for the best record in the NFL. No question, the guy who leads the way is Jason Kelsey right up front. Jason Kelsey continuing his incredible streak, extending his Eagles franchise record to 146 consecutive starts. <laughs> Congratulations are in order for you. You set an Eagles record for starting the most games in a row. Yeah. Hey, he's, been, just, he's still doing it. Yeah. <laughs> the center is a veteran on the field. And now in the music studio, where he and his teammates, offensive tackles Jordan Mailata and Lane Johnson, have been working on their second holiday album. We got an exclusive first look of the players tackling a Mariah Carey classic. These NFL players showing how the Eagles have some songbirds. All I want for Christmas is you. How did that feel to take on that song? I mean, it's a classic. Yeah, that, I mean, it was it was, it was kind of nerve wracking at first, just because you didn't know, can't really do the same key as the queen of the holidays. <laughs> I mean, she's incredible. Yeah. So we kind of had to dial it back a couple keys. A Philly special Christmas special comes after their first album was a hit, turning casual singers into recording artists. We sing around a lot. Like, Lane and I go in the same car after a game sometime and we'll listen to songs. But it's not like Christmas at all. That first day of the studio. Yeah, then it got real when we got In <laughs> <laughs> what way did it get real? Well, you're doing vocal warm-ups with uh, Coach E. <laughs> when you realize your vocal ability may not be, uh, he knows, Australian offensive tackle Jordan Mailata stunned Jason Kelsey last year with his rendition of White Christmas. I said, hi, 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 I'm dreaming of a white. Christmas. For the latest album, he took on a duet with Philly legend Patti LaBelle. This time, he was the speechless one. 
I got stage right. Really? Like, real bad. <laughs> yeah. I, they were like, you know, your mic's working. <laughs> you know, like, your mic's working. I was just, every time I opened my mouth to sing with her, I just couldn't. Yeah. It's all for a good cause. That album raised more than a million dollars for local charities. Santa Claus is coming. They've also garnered a legion of new fans, including Jason Kelsey's daughter, Wyatt. Look Hi, at you. Chad. Who's a rising star on social media. Wyatt all last Christmas, she kept asking to hear Santa is coming to town. They're, they're all into it for sure. Philly locals are into it too. One family bidding for an awkward Christmas photo with the trio. The proceeds benefiting the Eagles Autism Foundation. The players feeling lots of love from the Philadelphia community. I think once they found out, you know, it wasn't a joke and there was actually some mm -hmm. little bit of talent on there uh, and ability, uh, <laughs> it made a lot more, uh, a lot better. As for future Eagles holiday albums, well, they may have a special cameo in mind. So true story, on the way here, I turn on the music and I hear you guys and it was a genuine like joy. Good. And the person I was in the car with, they're like, what's going on? Who is this? And I'm like, well, it's secret, but we're listening to a song. <laughs> you know, it's the Eagles. What song these are, are the, these are the Eagles players. And true story, are they singing with Taylor Swift? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, maybe not this one. Not this time around. No? Maybe. I don't know who that is. <laughs> it can happen. Talk about, about raising money for charity. You could break the internet with that, that duet. Would, that would be pretty incredible. But maybe volume three. Yeah, maybe, maybe in the future. Maybe volume three. Merry Christmas, Philadelphia. And a happy new year. Coming up, we're gonna switch gears and meet the 12-year-old Phenom who loves cars, espresso, and teaching others about what's going on under the hood. Stay with us. the boost you are about to meet a young mechanic who is wise way beyond his years when it comes to cars and he's hoping to inspire other kids to get under the hood Al's got that story I'm 12 years old and I'm obsessed with cars ever since I was not even born yet Giuseppe Ayatollah is 12 going on 30 a cup of black espresso might oh, help this situation. Oh, here we go again with the coffee, see? Oh, it never ends. The preteen automotive phenom has amassed more than 200,000 followers on his Instagram channel at Giuseppe's Garage. Giuseppe, what do you got going on here? So here's the basics. Where he shares tips about car maintenance and repair. When I first taken cars apart, I was probably about six years old, more or less. So I'm very familiar with cars being taken apart. Basically, I have the magic touch. That magic touch is hereditary. Giuseppe's dad, Luciano, has been in the business for 31 years, opening his shop, Lucky's Auto Body, in 2008. The industry is changing big time, big time. So it's going to be a, even harder for a, for a young kid to actually get involved with the collision work or the, or the mechanic work. But the Ayatarola family is hoping Giuseppe's online presence inspires a new generation of auto enthusiasts. I see a new driver, let's say they're driving along to get a flat tire. They don't know how to change the tire. So I would like to be there to show them how, because if a six-year-old can do it, 
why can't you, you know? Then you divide. Giuseppe splits his time between homeschooling and working at the body shop. Mom Rachel helps keep that motor running smoothly. He's a straight A student, even taking high school level math. Do your trick yeah. with the two wrenches. Yeah, I'm gonna have to. I love the shop. I can't, he can't get me out. He hasn't missed a day. If I season. have a cold, let's say, if I'm sick, I'm still in here. He I have would to fight, fight with him. Just Do like, something, no, I you know. can't. I gotta go paint the fender, you know? Luciano understands his son's commitment to shop time, having grown up wishing he could spend more time working on repairs. When he came along, I, f I figured I'm not going to do that. As long as he's doing good in school, he can come to shop. Giuseppe keeping up his end of the bargain and then some. Just this year, being hired by the PBS show Motor Week, the youngest host in the show's history. He actually got one running for them. There was a 1964 Renault Dolphin. And I'm like, I can get this running. He started laughing, you can't get this running. The whole valve train was all seized. I got everything loose. Well, you know what the car was running. Though he's still at least four years away from getting his driver's license, Giuseppe learned to drive before he could even touch the pedals. Put the seat all the way forward. I was putting a, can of, a gallon of antifreeze behind him because the seat was too big, so he wouldn't slide back and has his first car all picked out. Actually, he still has his first car, and that's the one I want as my first car. And he always wanted it a certain way. He's so nice to me. Yeah. <laughs> so we're gonna fix it, and that's what I want my first car to be. What, what else can I expect out of a kid? He's perfect. I wouldn't change a thing. I can see how much he does for me. I think to myself, how do I, um, thank him like what do I do to make it up to him keep doing everything you're doing and we'll we'll both be just fine okay deal yeah. deal deal speaking of cars Harry Smith has the story of a car wash in Florida that is changing the lives of its workers and its community a car wash is a car wash unless it is a rising tide car wash in Florida thank you have a great day bold demonstration of inclusion, productivity, and self-esteem. So my brother Andrew's on the autism spectrum, and my father and I were really struggling with what he was gonna be able to do when he became an adult. Tom Derry's dad bought a struggling car wash where he hoped Andrew could work. Andrew and a lot of other people like him, and... We were able to take our first location that was only washing 35,000 cars a year, and turn that around to one that now washes over 170,000 cars a year and turn it into two more car washes here in Broward County, Florida that are even more successful than the first. But know this, it has not been easy. It was very difficult. For many new hires, it was their first real work experience. There was trial and error aplenty, but especially on the part of Tom and his dad. Is the business failing the employee or is the employee failing the business? And nine times out of 10, it's the business that needs to improve to better support the employee. For instance, getting the cars into the wash itself normally requires contact with the public, sometimes not their team member's strong suit. So they came up with this simple sign, then color-coded the control panel. So you were showing me the panel there. Yeah. I couldn't do that panel. Bree's exceptional at that. She's able to stay calm in really chaotic situations. She's pumped about it. It took a while for Bree Mathis to learn the job, but she told us she's a pro now. My new goal is that I'll be able to save a lot of money for me to travel. We noticed a flag on her mask. You want to go to Brazil? Absolutely, tootly, sir. You're right, tootly. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Derry has written a book about his lessons learned over the last 10 years. We read it. You talk about peeling away layers of trauma. What's the trauma? A lot of time, our employees experience significant bullying when they're in high school, as well as not feeling like they fit in to anywhere. But when they come here, this is the first time that there was a culture and a community really built for them. A place where mistakes can be made, where mistakes are even welcome. So we call this the dignity of failure, in that in order for people to grow, you have to push people to the edge of their capacity. John Paul has worked here for six years. He told us he loves being part of a team. 
Are you getting better at your job? I am. I'm yeah. getting better at um, talking to customers. One of the best measures of success at Rising Tide is the number of employees who leave. We've had over 100 of our team members that have worked with us over the last decade have moved on to other jobs in the community. How many? Over 100. To celebrate, they throw a party. What do you hope your employees earn more than just a paycheck here? I hope they earn a sense of self-worth and a sense of self-confidence, that they know that this isn't the only job for them. There's a lot that this life has to offer them, and this is just the beginning. Coming up, a couple who opened their home to more love and the surprise phone call that transformed this Texas family forever. Stay with us. Back here on The Boost, we enjoy celebrating all kinds of families like the one we found in Texas that recently got a little bigger after a surprise phone call. Jenna has their beautiful story. My name is Marissa and I am 14 years old. I was adopted from China and I think I was 11 months old. She um, was just a joy. She was just an amazing baby. She was so special. Over the years, she always asked for a sibling. She always wanted a baby sister. We just felt like our family was together. Our family was complete. Or we thought it was complete. <laughs> but nine months ago, Marissa's parents, Dina and Thomas, got a call. There were two boys who'd lost both of their parents within five months of each other. They were living with their 77-year-old grandfather, but needed a forever home. I remember the night we sat down and had a little family meeting and we talked about um, what, we, what we were doing, what our plan was, and we asked her how she felt about it. And she started crying, like she was so excited. So that's when we felt like we knew we were doing the right thing. I was excited for this change and I was excited to have someone to hang with. I was expecting them to be girls. We first had a phone call with the boy's grandfather and the phone call went great. And then a couple of weeks later, we actually drove to his house. When we walked up to the door, Levi was jumping up and down because he was so excited to meet us. And I remember at one point I asked Joseph, I said, are you nervous, Joseph? And he said, yeah. I said, you know what, I am too. <laughs> you know, it was kind of a, an emotional day. I was very happy because I could never imagine being a big sister. I've always wanted to be, but I never actually thought I would be. So the oldest one is eight, and he's in third grade. He asks a lot of questions, very inquisitive. The little one is three. He's always moving, always climbing, always jumping, throwing. We have to watch him every minute. <laughs> they add a bunch of energy to the house. They both love her, so. They do. I think she'll be an awesome, sister. Right now she is. Her and the little man have really bonded over that relationship. Here we go. Today is a big day for Marissa and her family, Adoption Day. 
Marissa is officially becoming a big sister, and after a lot of heartbreak, her little brothers, Joseph and Levi, are getting a new family. Okay. Hi. How are you? Good. I met her before the court is a final adoption. Good looking boys. You were the only boy in the family and you needed boys, is yeah, that right? Yes, I wanted okay. to outnumber the girls. <laughs> so you wanted to step back into being a granddad? Yes. Okay. So you agree this adoption is in the best interest of, their of these yes, children? Yes, I do. The court approves the adoption uh, order as proposed and grants this adoption. Thank you. <laughs> I just think there couldn't have been a better couple and family to adopt them. They've been through more than boys should have to be. My hope is that they grow up and feel secure and feel loved. I'm very excited to watch them grow up and make memories with them. I get to be with a new family and I have a new mom and dad and I have a sister. I have an more family members and now I have two families, kind of. That's right, buddy. We're a family. Yeah. When she kept saying she wanted a sister and she wanted a sister, I said, well, you know what? I said, God knows what we need. I really think that's how we all met and, and came together. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, we needed these boys as much as they needed us. <laughs> How beautiful is that story? And today is World Adoption Day, and we are so proud to say that the Styles family is officially a family of five, and they are here with us. They're here with us today. Deanna, Marissa, Joseph, Levi, and Thomas. Oh my gosh, you guys, we're so happy you're here. Thanks Thank for having you. us. Thanks Thank you for, for being here. Okay, so Dina, we know that the adoption was finalized. We got to yes. be there. You said in the piece that you, you needed these boys as much as they needed you. Yes. You know, we were a three a threesome for so long, and we always knew that Marissa wanted a sibling, and we always knew we wanted more children. <laughs> and it was just never the right time, and it yeah. suddenly it seemed the right time, and we matched up, and... I just think it was just a God thing. We were meant to be. Coming up next, a prominent spine surgeon who found a new purpose in his profession after a serious bicycle accident turned him into a patient. His life-changing injury has given him a new perspective on the importance of hope. NBC's Priscilla Thompson has that story. In just one moment, a carefree bike race with friends four years ago changed Dr. Rex Marco's life forever. I heard a crack and I just, just driven over my handlebars and onto the ground, head first, helmet first. A friend and fellow biker rushed to his side. I asked him to touch my foot and tell me if it was moving and I couldn't feel him. And I knew in that moment that there was less than 5% chance that I would ever walk again or that I would ever operate again, or that I would ever hold my unborn child. Dr. Marco spent the next few weeks in and out of the ICU and was on a ventilator for three months. Okay, shrug him up, Dr. Marco. Here. He spent years in rehab, finding a way to live this new life with quadriplegia. It is the hardest thing that's ever happened to me. When did you decide, I'm going to go back to work? I always knew I was going back to work. There was no doubt in my mind. This year, Dr. Marco returned to work full time with a new mission, teaching the next generation of doctors how to better care for patients with spinal cord injuries. Those moments of apparent lack of empathy and lack of sympathy and lack of compassion were difficult. Sharing with them the importance of hope. The nurse told my son, your dad's never going to walk again. And that's a hopeless statement. And so hopefully you can give your patients hope. How do you feel like this will impact the way you think about treating patients? It'll remind me that my patients are human, just like me. And I'm treating a human, not a condition, not a disease. Whenever you have that difficult patient, they're expressing their frustrations. Dr. Marco is working with patients again, too, including 20-year-old Thane Stark, who was paralyzed four months ago after jumping into the ocean. 
what has the impact of that relationship been for you? It has been absolutely reassuring. Do you feel like he gives you hope? I do, absolutely. Dr. Marco's work now taking on new meaning. I feel more connected to my fellow human being. And I feel like there's a bigger, deeper message. It is different because I can touch more lives now. Transforming lives, part of his own journey toward healing. For Sunday Today, Priscilla Thompson, Houston. Just ahead, the latest viral video to boost your day. Do not miss it. Welcome back to The Boost. We've got one more story for you that'll leave you with a smile. Y'all know the feeling when your favorite song comes on, right. it gives you a little boost of energy, you get some excitement. Well, the two-year-old girl you're about to see takes it next level. Take a look. That's his hit single, Need a Favor. Cute. That little girl loves it. Jelly Roll saw it. Uh, he saw the video on Facebook. He responded saying, this may be the single cutest video I have ever seen. Oh. That is all for today. We hope we were able to start your day off with a little boost of positivity. And guess what? We will see you right here tomorrow with more of the boost right here on Today All Day. Hi everybody, welcome to Hometown Holidays on Today All Day. As we head into the holiday season, we have gathered beloved chefs and friends of the Today Show to share their favorite festive memories and a delicious dish from their family table. All right, so we're moving the mains aside. Today, it is gonna be all about the scrumptious sides. We, we traveled all across the country to visit several folks right at home. For example, we got Curtis Stone whipping up the perfect starter to celebrate an Aussie-style Christmas. Layla Ali is sharing her sweet and savory cornbread dressing. And you do not wanna miss comedian Sebastian Maniscalco making a recipe inspired by his grandma. But first up, I went to visit my good friend, Chef Marcus Samuelson, at one of his Manhattan restaurants, Hav and Mar. Growing up in Sweden, Marcus learned to cook with his grandma, Helga, during the holidays, so he had plenty of delicious memories to share with us. 
Marcus. How are you, my friend? friend? How are you? Welcome oh. to Chelsea. Welcome to Hop Mar. So, Marcus, you know, it's the holidays. Give me a sense of how you grew up. Well, I was born in a hut in Ethiopia. And then at a very early age, my sister and I and my birth mother, we had tuberculosis. My mom passed away, but me and my sister, we got cured. And then we got adopted to Sweden. And I went from being Kasahunse guy to Marcus Samuelson. I went from eating injera and hot stuff to herring and boiled potatoes. <laughs> so what were the holidays like for you, you know, growing up? Well, the holidays were actually my favorite time of the year because my grandmother, she was the food factory. All relatives came to Grandma Helga's house and she just produced. Early November, mm -hmm. it was like always bread to be made, saffron buns to be rolled, herring to be pickled, uh, always something, right? And as you get closer to December and mid-December, the big Swedish smorgasbord started to happen where there's like seven types of herring, five types of salmon, <laughs> meatballs through the roof. And she made all of it. When you're an immigrant, you always have your foot in the old country, although you're not there. Mm -hmm. And we kind of do in a hybrid at home now, right? With my two kids, uh, with my wife, there will always be some Swedish glugs, but it all will be Ethiopian dishes. And plus, of course, Thanksgiving turkey. If there was only one thing that you could eat of your grandmother's, mm. what would it be? Her Swedish meatballs. What makes those Swedish meatballs stand out? Well, our family was a Swedish middle-class family, but our grandparents coming up were poor. And when you have a Swedish meatball, you can really feel the poverty. Because it's, you know, there's breadcrumbs in there. Why is there breadcrumbs? Because there was enough meat around. Everything was about filling out right. because you didn't- Stretching it. Stretching it. That's what the Swedish meatball really represent me. So how do we get started with, with Grandma Helga's meatball? Yeah, we got beef. Uh-huh. But the second beef meat we're putting in is actually lamb today. Oh. Just, just because the fat content is better. And then we have breadcrumbs. Mm -hmm. We're gonna put in some cream. You can just start, just start, just start massaging that, yes. Right. I'm gonna add in some salt. Okay. And then again, some spices. This is the Ethiopian spice blend, bada bada. Oh. Right? And a little bit, of just cumin in, and just for flavor. Mm -hmm. Just a bunch of more salt. That's a touch of olive oil. All right, so a little more fat. Yes. It's a nice golden brown garlic. So that, that's perfect. Okay. You've done that before. Hey, hey. And here comes the meatball competition. Uh-oh, meatball uh, competition. We, we, okay. And the key, I think, for meatball is that they should actually be bigger than you normally see them because if they're too small, mm -hmm. they're going to get dry. Look at that. Boom. A little bit bigger than a golf ball, I would say. Smaller than a baseball, but bigger than, bigger than a golf ball. Right? Look at that. Perfect. Right. Nice and loose. So we got our meatballs. They look delicious. We're gonna take these gloves off that mm -hmm. I never get used to cooking with. We're gonna go over here. Okay. So Marcus, this is a combination. You have, have some oil and some butter. In oil there. and butter. And also not too many meatballs in the pan. I For like to cook the meatballs with basically two pans with the meatballs. We always had mash. We're gonna put it quickly in our fancy, fancy oven here, just like that. And then we have our gravy. We have a little bit of cream. Uh -huh. I'm gonna add in, and this is kind of where my journey of the world comes in. But we're gonna add in some chicken stock, pickle juice. In our Did you case, say pickle juice? Pickle juice, exactly. That's what we're Pickle juice add. is having a moment it's right now. It's having a moment. It's gonna be a hot topic on today's show. <laughs> but here's where I take sort of my inspiration for my journey on my travel, right? So I'm adding in a little bit of miso. Oh, right? wow a little bit of mole, and then breadcrumbs. Right. And some pepitas, some pumpkin seeds. Wow. Uh, the flavors of breadcrumbs that we're having there. We're just gonna simmer this together. And then ah. we have a beautiful gravy. I think we're ready, we're almost ready to play. Let's play. Let's play. Now we just got the gravy left. Mm -hmm. And then we had those 
sesame seeds, mm -hmm. and crunch. we add a little crunch, exactly. Pumpkin seeds, toasted pumpkin yes. seeds. And just some pic pickled uh, yeah, onions. Just some pickled onions, you know. There would never be a Swedish meal without some pickles. Okay. All right. All right. And when, for me, I can't eat this without thinking about my whole family. Oh. Comfort, right? Grandma Tolga would be yes. very proud. Isn't that good? Happy holidays. Mm -hmm. Man, those meatballs were a holiday party for your mouth. Up next, we're gonna head to Nashville where country star and cookbook author, Jesse James Decker, shows us not one, but two ways to make bread more beautiful. My love for the holidays started very early because my mom was very, very festive and I really do feel like it trickled down to me and my siblings. Every year, mom would make hot apple cider and she'd put on Christmas music and we would all decorate the tree. It was something really fun and she would hand the ornaments to us one by one. Now I carry those traditions over into my family. The kids love cooking with me, especially Forrest. He's in love with cooking. He will bring me my cookbook and open it to the page. He wants to make something and we will just, you know, go to town. It's so much fun. It's such a great thing you can do with your children. So I'm pregnant with our fourth baby and it was such a special surprise. I love being pregnant around the holidays, especially because I can just feast a little extra more. A new holiday tradition that I have started is my cranberry pull-apart bread. It's so easy to do, so easy to prep, but once it's finished, I mean, it looks fancy. It's just perfect for everybody. The sweet, delicious cranberry pull-apart bread was such a hit, I thought to myself, why don't we expand upon this and do a variation of it, but do a savory version. And so I started thinking of all the things Eric had in the garden. I've always got rosemary, parsley. I love garlic. Oh, he's got tons of garlic. And so I just felt like, you know what? Let's see how this turns out. And it turned out just beautifully. Hey, y'all. Welcome to Nashville. I am so excited to share with you two of my favorite recipes. The holidays are here. And so I have the perfect two side dishes that will just warm your family's hearts. We've got a sweet and a savory. We're going to start by cubing and cutting the bread. There you go. It's cubed to perfection. Now we're going to grab our mixing bowl and we're going to start combining some of our ingredients. So we're going to take our pecans, our brown sugar, our dried cranberries, the butter. We're gonna add a little bit of this orange zest. And I just think it adds a little citrus something something. We're gonna add a little bit of juice. Now we're gonna mix the ingredients. You can use your hands, you can use your fork, whatever feels right. I think it's ready to put aside. I'm gonna wash my hands and we're gonna get to stuffing the brie. All right, y'all, it's time to start filling the loaf. You're just gonna stuff as much as you can in between each little cube. There's gonna be a point in time where you're gonna be like, is that enough? Should I give up? But you don't. You find every single crack and crevice you can, and you just keep stuffing. We did it. Now it's time to start stuffing the crumbly stuff. Just the last little bit. And the last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna cover it in mozzarella cheese. So now that the sweet version of this is finished, I'm gonna show you my savory version for those that like a little bit of a salty flavor. So we've pre-cut and cubed our bread just like I showed you before, but this time we're actually gonna start stuffing it with the brie first. All right, we're so close. Last one. Now it's time to make the delicious savory herb butter. We're gonna throw in a little garlic, parsley, salt, rosemary. Now it's time to spread the herb butter onto the bread. You're gonna paint this on all over. And the last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna cover it with our mozzarella cheese. Gorgeous. It's ready to join its sweet little friend over there. I like to cover it with tin foil because the top will get a little crisp. All right, y'all, these buns are going in the oven.
They're all finished and they're absolutely ready now to garnish. And now, drum roll for my favorite part, we're gonna taste. Mmm, this looks like a good piece. Ooh, look at that. Mmm, so I'm gonna have to take this away. I could eat the whole thing. And you're gonna watch everyone just tear this thing apart and fight over that very last bite because it is just that delicious. I hope y'all enjoyed these recipes. They are such a tradition in my home and I hope they become one for you guys as well. So y'all have a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and I'll see y'all soon. Stick around for more show-stopping sides. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Hometown Holidays on Today All Day. Now, Top Chef Judge Gail Simmons certainly knows a thing or two about creating an elevated culinary experience. Up next, she's sharing a twist on traditional Hanukkah latkes. And later, Chef Jordan Andino is gonna whip up carrots like you have never seen before. Sharing the food that's important to me, I think, shows who I am, my heritage, my history. I think that there's like so many ways of making food as an offering of peace to the world. I grew up with food as a really huge focus in my life. My mother was actually a cooking teacher. She ran a cooking school out of our home when I was very little. We spent all our time in the kitchen with her. There's dozens of dishes that I have memories of her making when I was a child for all different occasions. You know, holidays certainly were occasions where we ate very memorable food because it was a tradition. In my house, we really celebrated Hanukkah in a big way. We play with dreidels and Hanukkah gelts. We give gifts, but small gifts. You know, Hanukkah for us was never really about gift giving. It was more about being together. And then we always have a big Hanukkah feast. Not only do we light the candles for eight nights, but we cook with oil, which is why letkas are made. It's not so much about the potato they're made with, it's more about the oil that they're fried in. Making letkas was a big deal in my house. We would walk into the house probably two weeks before Hanukkah, after school, and smell that smell. It's such, in my head, the most iconic smell of the season. Today I'm making a bit of an elevated play on a traditional Hanukkah latka. Usually you would just use potatoes and onions, but I'm gonna use parsnips, which add a mellow, delicious sweetness to them. And then I'm gonna top the latkes with some very special celebratory ingredients for an adult version. All right, I start by peeling one russet potato, and I'm gonna put it through the food processor with two shallots. 
When the potatoes and onions have been shredded, I'm gonna drain them in a colander over a bowl for a few minutes. And then, while these are draining, I'll shred my parsnips. If you don't have a food processor, you can absolutely just use a box grater, which is more traditionally how lekkas would have been made. And then we're gonna mix the potatoes and the parsnips all together. Give that a stir. And then I'm gonna add my binding agents, my egg, my flour, a little baking powder and salt. While I'm mixing all my ingredients together, I'm also heating my oil. I have about a quarter inch of vegetable oil in a heavy bottom pan on my stovetop, and I'm gonna let it come up to heat. Now it's time to make the lekkas. I want them to be light and fluffy, so I'm using a big tablespoon, and I like to keep it flattened on the spoon. I can also do a little squish here to squish out any excess liquid, and then I'm just going to slide it right into my pan. And you can flatten it down a bit too. You want the oil to come up kind of half to three quarters of the way around the latka so you can see that it's bubbling and starting to cook. You know they're ready when they start to get really nice and golden brown around the edges, and you can give each one a flip. And there you go, you can see that it's perfectly cooked and golden. It takes about three to four minutes per side, so about seven minutes total for each latka. You can see how evenly it's cooked on both sides. You go right on a paper towel lined plate. And then you just want to sprinkle them with a little bit of salt while they're still warm. You could eat these just as they are, and they would be fantastic. But if I'm having a holiday party, I like to dress them up a little bit, give them a bit of an adult spin. So I have a few of my favorite celebratory ingredients here. Creme fraiche, and I'm gonna just take a little bit. You can obviously use sour cream. Give it a little swirl. It's really rich and delicious, especially on a wet cup. And then I have a few different types of smoked fish. I have smoked trout and I have smoked salmon. And I'm gonna do a few. And then I'm gonna put on some trout roe and some herbs. This is actually fennel fronds, the tops of a fennel bulb. You can also use dill, any really tender herb. And here you go, perfect celebratory holiday appetizer or side dish. My parsnip and potato latkes with smoked fish and trout roe. A perfectly fried latka at Hanukkah is exactly what I crave. To me, there is nothing more delicious that represents my heritage than this. Wishing you a safe, peaceful, and festive holiday season. Cheers, everyone. I would say that because of the style of household that I grew up in, we'll call it traditional Asian, <laughs> I would say food is the love language. My skills in cooking came from two people, my grandmother, or Lola, as we like to call it in Tagalog, in the Filipino national language, and then my dad. I just loved cooking with them. It was a way for us to bond, and I could see that they loved me if they didn't necessarily say it as often as I'd like. Food is the central focus of our, our holiday parties. Yes, we're gathering to spend time with the people who we love and adore, but it was always centered around food every single time. This is the first holiday season where I get to spend with my little baby girl. And wow, I, I, I get emotional even just thinking about her because I didn't know that you could love someone, something, the way I, I feel about this little girl. And I can't wait to instill all these traditions that I've been practicing for 35 years onto her. Since I grew up and have my own family, I do Friendsgivings. And that's my way of bringing the tradition of my family back to the, my network and people who I know and love now. They always ask me, like, can I bring anything? I'm like, no, don't bring anything, I'll do it all. That's how I show my love. I show my love through food. I like when people come to my Thanksgiving dinners or my holiday dinners and they go, you've ruined dinner parties for me. Because the food is so good, the atmosphere is so good, the vibe is so good. And I'm like, mission accomplished. Let's go, baby. <laughs> so what I'm cooking today is a charred maple glazed carrot. And it's actually a riff of what I used to make with my dad and my grandmother growing up. They'd always take root vegetables, mix it with oil, um, sh brown sugar, maple syrup, salt, pepper, give, give you like a nice char. And that flavor has always stuck with me. 
All right, everyone, I am in the carriage house kitchen, and right now I'm gonna show you how to make the maple chard heirloom carrot dish. So I have my heirloom carrots here. I remove the tops. And what you're gonna do is just get, cut them on a diagonal bias to help with the roasting process, cooking time. And we're gonna throw them into a mixing bowl. And I love using these style of carrots, specifically the heirloom carrots. It gives you different dynamics of presentation and of course color and also flavor. So once you have your little mix posted up in here, you're gonna take your vinaigrette, which is a maple syrup vinaigrette, has a little bit of other spices and oil in there, a little bit of salt and pepper. And once it's done, you're gonna throw that right onto your roasting pan and then that eventually is gonna go into the oven. But while that happens, we're gonna use this mandolin here to get our heirloom carrots ribbons so that it'll be a nice, beautiful garnish that also mimics the base of flavor from the dish. So here's your carrots. You're gonna put them in the oven, roast them until they're charred and black. High temperature, about 10 to 15 minutes at 500 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, so next step, we're gonna take all of these delicious cheeses and make our feta whipped mousse. You're gonna take some feta cheese, mascarpone cheese, and then you're gonna take some smooth ricotta and put that in as well. Super easy. You're gonna blend that until smooth and combined. All right, this is done. We're gonna put this off to the side and now let's start making the carrot top pesto. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take these carrot tops that we reserved from the beginning of the preparation of this dish I'm gonna put that in a blender, and then we're gonna combine it with salt, pepper, and a little bit of olive oil. And the beauty about this garnish is that it's delicious, it's herbaceous, and it also gives you that kind of earthy, greener flavor of carrot on top of the roasted carrot, so it reinforces it and layers that flavor. And we're just gonna blend it until smooth. Time to get it done. Charred carrots, put that in to the same vinaigrette they were roasted in to compound that flavor a little bit. Next, we're gonna do a little salt, a little bit of pepper. So now this is ready to rock. So once they're on the plate, you can then give it a little bit of a light garnish here. Next, we're gonna take the mousse that we made to put in a piping bag. And we're just gonna give it a little bit of dollops all around. Then we're gonna give it a little bit of that carrot top pesto and just sprinkled all around. And last but not least, carrot tops as the garnish. This dish to me just represents togetherness. It represents my friends' givings and feeding all the people that I love and care about. So this right here is really my heart, my home, my heritage shared with you and shared with all my friends.
Welcome back to Hometown Holidays. Up next, we're going to head to Atlanta, where boxing champ Layla Ali is making a dish that's sure to be a real knockout on your holiday table. People often ask me what my childhood was like, um, being that my father was a global icon and we couldn't go anywhere without him being recognized. You can imagine it was pretty interesting, but I just remember having a lot of love in our family. We have this huge dining room table, so you can imagine the spread that would be on that table for the holiday seasons. We would have family and friends over, and there would be so much food on that table. And then as I grew older, I started teaching myself how to cook when I was about eight or nine years old. When I decided to become a boxer and said, what is it going to take to be a world champion? That's when I first learned about how important the food that I ate was. It's nice to be able to prepare meals for my kids now, and we're still eating some of the foods that I grew up on, right? My son loves mac and cheese, and then my daughter is always looking forward to her pot of greens, and really seeing them devour it and love it, you know, that's really what just warms my heart. Dressing is one of those dishes that I grew up eating many different versions of. It's not that hard to make. You can make it on a, on a regular basis, but it's just not special if you do that. It's just one of those things. You just want it for the holidays. It is just so delicious, and I actually want some right now. <laughs> Welcome to my kitchen. I'm so excited to have you here, and I'm going to show you how I make my favorite holiday side, which is my sweet and savory cornbread dressing. The first thing I'm going to do is chop up these veggies. I'm going to start with some celery. Now I'm going to chop up this green onion. It really is a preference on how much you want to use, but I like a lot of onion. This is a sweet onion. There are so many different types of onions that you can use. I definitely like to use at least two types of onion. Okay, so the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start working on my herbs. And I actually have some fresh herbs from my garden, which I'm really excited about because they smell so fragrant right now and they're not even cooking yet. One of the herbs that I absolutely cannot make this dish without is sage. Sage is just so earthy. And I also have some fresh rosemary. It smells so good. Now we're gonna go ahead and prepare this thyme. On some of these woodier stems, I make sure to pull the leaves off. Okay, so we have our veggies chopped up, we have our herbs prepared, and now we're ready to get cooking. All right, I'm gonna start by heating up some olive oil in this pan. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and add the veggies. And we're gonna cook these for about five to seven minutes until they really start to sweat and cook down. Okay, so the veggies are looking nice and soft, so now you know it's time to add the turkey. So I'm using ground turkey. It's about two pounds, but it really adds a lot of nice flavor, especially if you use turkey with fat. You don't want to get the lean turkey. Now I'm going to add some garlic powder, onion powder, seasoning salt, a little cayenne pepper for a nice little kick, and I'm going to also use some coconut aminos not only for the health benefit, but also the flavor. It adds a nice sweetness. So you definitely want to break up this turkey while it's cooking. Get everything mixed in together. Okay, so the turkey's almost done cooking, so I'm gonna go ahead and add my fresh herbs. This adds so much flavor. All right, this is looking good. I'm gonna go ahead and turn the heat off. While this is cooling down, I'm going to prep my cornbread and get my other ingredients ready. So I like to use sweet cornbread because that is what's going to give us the balance of sweet and savory. So you've got the sweet cornbread, you've got the savory turkey and veggie mixture. Then we're going to add the egg and the chicken stock. And this is going to hydrate the cornbread. So as I'm mixing, the cornbread is breaking down even further and that's okay. We're not going to have big chunks here. And it's going to be nice and moist but not runny. So this is nice and mixed up, and now I'm going to put it in my baking dish. Now you probably need about a nine by 13. I'm using a round dish. You wanna make sure it's not too deep because you wanna make, you want it to cook. You don't want it too deep where it's gonna be soggy in the middle. I'm gonna cover this with foil and bake it for about 35 minutes. All right, I cannot wait to taste this. 
top is nicely brown the way that I like it. Look at that texture. Mm. Mm. That is so delicious. You know what, I really hope that you try my recipe this holiday season because I guarantee that your family is gonna love it. Hope you're gonna stick around because we're gonna be right back. Welcome back to Hometown Holidays. Now, if these dishes are making your mouth water, well, all you have to do is scan the QR code right here for all of these delicious recipes. Up next, we've got a little flavor from down under for you, mate. Chef Curtis Stone is whipping up one of his favorite salads fit for an Aussie-style Christmas. To me, the holidays are all about family. You know, I've got young kids and they just have such a great time around the holidays and it makes you be a big kid with them. Aussie Christmases are totally different because it's the middle of our summer. So, you know, on Christmas day, you might go for a surf before uh, sitting down to have um, your Christmas lunch. And of course, for the holidays, we're cooking on the barbie back in Australia, for sure. Whether it's throwing some beautiful fresh seafood on there, um, we, we normally start with some prawns or shrimp Christmas morning. Of course, the most traditional dessert to have around the holidays is pavlova. And a pavlova, of course, is a beautiful big meringue, fresh cream, beautiful fruit over the top of it. Um, it's a really light, summery kind of a dessert, but I kind of like serving it no matter what the weather. My boys love being in the kitchen with me, especially on Christmas morning. It's a great time when you can pull them away from their presents for a minute. I normally give them one dish each that they're responsible for, and then they get to say, this is mine and this is how I made it, and they get to tell the whole table about it, and they're pretty proud of that. For my holidays, my mum always cooks roast pork and she's so good at it. She gets that skin super crispy. We call it the cracklings and everyone fights over those cracklings. Um, gravy, of course, stuffing is, is absolutely on there. And then all the traditional sides, but a couple of fresh salads thrown in as well. I'm sure you've already guessed, but I'm an Aussie. And in Australia, of course, our holiday season is the middle of our summer. So we tend to serve lots of salads with the roast turkey and the roast pork and the roast beef. Um, and I think it is a really nice combination because you want something kind of light and crunchy to go with those rich roasted meats. So I'm gonna show you a shaved Brussels sprout salad. All right, the first thing you do is you cook the quinoa and then you let it dry. Now we're gonna make it crisp. So you get yourself a nice hot pan and pour a little oil. You take the quinoa and you just dump it in. You'll hear a little sizzle and you give the pan a little shake. And then for the next five or six minutes, you're gonna keep your eye on it and it's gonna sort of puff ever so slightly. While we wait for that to happen, let's make the dressing. So you want yourself a blender, right? I've got some tarragon, a little parsley and some fresh basil. So herbs, pistachios, 
garlic, a little mustard. The mustard gives it a really nice kind of a kick. I'm using white wine vinegar, but the truth is any kind of acid. Turn it on and just start it on a low speed. You can always crank it up and then you emulsify the oil. And you've got this beautiful dressing. I know what you're thinking. People have different feelings about Brussels sprouts, right? Now, usually the people that don't like Brussels sprouts used to have them overcooked and the whole house would smell like a sprout and they kind of get that weird smell that none of us like. Um, but if you eat them raw, you take a lot of that away. So this is a really different way of doing it. Now, in slicing these thin, I call them shaved, you can do two things. You can either cut them in half like this and using a sharp knife, you can kind of go through each sprout and you can slice it really, really thinly, right? And that's what we're looking for, a really fine shaved um, sprout. Here's what I do. I get myself a mandolin. Um, lots of people have these. I love mine because it comes with a cut-proof glove. <laughs> uh, and if you want to get them really fine, here's another great little trick. Just cut the Brussels sprout straight down the middle. This will allow you to shave them really fine. You're gonna mix those into a bowl. Then what you do is you take your dressing and you spoon this straight over quite liberally. Give that a little toss. Little individual plates like that. I actually take a good old scoop and this sort of becomes the center of our plate. Gorgeous. Then get yourself a couple of these pre-blanched pieces of broccoli. So we've just dropped them in some boiling water. Make sure the water's salted and you cook them for just a couple of minutes. I've got a few green beans as well. So I take a whole half avocado for each salad. You drop that in the center. Now for that beautiful crunchy quinoa and be really generous with it. I go all the way around. Then I take my dressing and I drizzle it all the way around the outside of the plate. But I give myself a little reservoir so when you actually cut into this avocado, you're gonna get this little explosion of that dressing. All right, that looks sensational. The last thing that you do is you pick up some of those finely chopped pistachios all over your gorgeous salad. I tell you what, it is a beautiful green salad. There is so much to love. There's lots of crunch in there. Beautiful with roasted meats. And just personally, it just takes me back to Australia for the festive season. Enjoy. One of the things that makes the holiday season, Christmas time, really special for me is that it's an opportunity to really celebrate the Puerto Rican traditions. And it's one of the times when I can feel most connected to my culture. Every winter, we kick off the holiday season by celebrating Thanksgiving with all my family and friends. And then we have Christmas, which for Puerto Ricans, we celebrate Noche Buena, which is actually the night before Christmas. Growing up, my mom always took charge in the kitchen around the holidays, although when I hit about junior high school, high school, that's when I joined in, because I always loved cooking. It's really fun to kind of continue those traditions and to cook these recipes that not only have been made in my family for years, but in generations of Puerto Rican families. The sonas are perfect for the holidays because they're meant to be shared. They're crispy, they're salty, the perfect kind of thing to snack on when you're sitting around talking and sharing, which is really what my favorite part of the holiday season is. While the sonas are perfect with just a sprinkle of salt, they're even better with a couple zesty dipping sauces, so let's whip those up first. First up is mayo ketchup. So first here we've got some mayonnaise in a bowl, and then we're just gonna add some ketchup to it, fresh lime. And then, of course, it would not be a Puerto Rican recipe without a lot of garlic. All right, this looks perfect. I'm gonna set it aside for now and let it hang out. Now we're gonna make a garlic citrus mojo. We're gonna start off by mashing some garlic. So I'm gonna add a little salt here and this just creates some friction. And then we add our garlic cloves a few at a time. And then we just mash. You really kind of want this to be a nice sort of a coarse paste, something that looks like this. And now we're gonna add a lot more fun flavor. Some dried oregano and some cumin. I'm gonna mix that in. We're also gonna be using our citrus juice. So whisk that all together, and then we're gonna add our olive oil. 
And we're gonna finish this off with a little bit of freshly cracked black pepper. All right, this looks amazing and ugh, smells even better. Creamy. All right, we're gonna set this aside. I'm gonna just clear up here a little bit and then it's time to make tostones. Tostones use green plantains. I love plantains. They're sort of a starchier version of bananas. To cut plantains, you wanna start off by trimming the ends. The best way to take it off is to kind of run the edge of your knife along the peel, just to kind of loosen it up. And then you sort of stick your finger in there and just sort of force it off. Once you get in, then it comes off pretty easily. And then you just keep repeating. Tostones are fried twice. For that first fry, we wanna cut these into about two inch pieces. So we've got our oil up to 325 degrees and we're just gonna drop them in gently, just like this. And you wanna see those bubbles start to form. Gorgeous. We're gonna let them go for about two or three minutes. You really just want them to get a little bit darker, like a golden yellow. All right, these look ready to come out. And I just like to drain these on like a paper towel lined baking sheet or plate even. That's what my mom would do. See how they have that slightly darker golden color? That's exactly what you're looking for. And then we repeat with the rest of the batch. And now it's time to smash these plantains. So a little parchment paper, a little plantain in the middle. Kind of put it in the center there. Smash it. Just a little twist is all you need. And voila, a perfectly smashed plantain. Perfect, all right, that's our last one. Now these are ready to go back into the hot oil for that second fry. The smell of the plantain frying in the hot oil just reminds me of my mother's kitchen. I'm gonna go ahead and take these out. Oh, these look amazing. They smell so good. As soon as you take them out, you wanna hit them with a little bit of salt while they're still hot so that the salt can stick to the tosones. Perfect. Now I'm gonna repeat the rest of the batch. These are perfect, they are golden, they're crispy, they're hot. I'm so ready to dive in, but first I gotta go grab those sauces. So I'm just gonna put a little bit of each of these sauces into these cute little serving bowls. This is just one of my most favorite things. You've got the salty, crispy tostón and our fantastic dipping sauces. Mm. I hope you give this recipe a try and find out why I love tostones so much. Feliz Navidad! Coming up, make some room at the table. Tiffany Thiessen is whipping up a boozy cranberry sauce, plus a spiked surprise. Then later, comedian Sebastian Maniscalco makes a family favorite that is no joke.
Welcome back to Hometown Holiday. Now, what would a true holiday feast be without cranberry sauce? Well, up next, Tiffany Thiessen is putting a boozy twist on this popular staple. I love many things about the holidays. I love the more kind of relaxed feel that everybody has. Usually most people are more joyous that time of year. I love that my kids are usually off from school and I get to spend more time with them, more quality time at home, and it really becomes more family time. So ever since I was a little girl, I used to always want to be in the kitchen with all the women in my family, because that's where they were. Every single one of them, my mother, my grandmother, my aunt. And I have very early visions of myself peering around the kitchen door, wanting to be in there with them, doing all the fun cooking that they do. There's many times where I love to do throw a, a really good potluck party, like an old school potluck party, which is really fun, because I like when people bring some of their favorite recipes. I definitely believe you shouldn't be one to do it all. Like, I believe you're gonna give yourself a headache. It's stressful. The cleanup's a nightmare. <laughs> you need to delegate. And my mom taught me that. Delegate and you're gonna enjoy it better. I grew up in a family, a very modest family, that um, my mom really was kind of the queen of leftovers. My new cookbook, Here We Go Again, is all about leftovers. She was really the one who inspired this book. So, you know, I really learned the value of food and also really wanting to teach my children now the importance of food waste. It's really perfect for the holidays because I feel like we all have holiday leftovers. So this actual recipe um, comes from taking the cranberry sauce that most people always have leftover cranberry sauce and doing a really fun cocktail out of it. I, of course, am a homemade cranberry sauce girl. It's funny, my husband, Texas boy, grew up with the old school canned, you know, sliced cranberry sauce. I did not grow up that way. I grew up with homemade, and it's kind of just something that I absolutely love. I'm gonna show you today how I make one of my classic dishes, the blood orange cranberry sauce that I always have on my table. But I'm also gonna show you what you can do with leftover cranberry sauce, and I'm gonna show you how to make it into a cocktail. So first, we're actually gonna take blood orange soda. Now, if you can't find blood orange, you of course can do regular orange. And we're gonna actually put this on the stove top and get it simmering. And what's nice about this is the color. And of course, color means a lot during the holidays. Now we're gonna take our dried oranges and we're gonna chop these up. And it's gonna get the moisture from the soda and all the other liquid is gonna actually get them all soft again once you put them in with the cranberries. So once you have your orange soda starting to simmer, you're gonna take your oranges, you're gonna take your cranberries whole, and you're gonna take your sugar, and you're gonna add it all the way over here. So we're gonna take our oranges, cranberries, sugar, mix this all up, and already it's smelling so good. Then we're gonna take our pomegranate molasses, and then we're gonna take our liqueur, and this is just two tablespoons. And what I love about them too is it really gives that gorgeous kind of like dark color that you want for your cranberry sauce. Let's not forget the pinch of salt. We're gonna let that sit and do its thing for about 10 minutes until all the cranberries really break down and get really super soft. The holidays always means that I break out my special silver that came from my dad's side of the family. Oh, it smells like the holidays already. Uh, cranberry sauce is one of those staples on every holiday table. I love it on, of course, my turkey or any sort of protein that you have for your holidays. So this will go, of course, right to the holiday table, nice and warm. Of course, you always have leftover cranberry sauce, so I'm gonna show you what to do with your leftover cranberry sauce. We're gonna make a really special cranberry sauce cocktail. All right, so we've got our little shaker with ice already because you want your cocktail chilled. We've got our bourbon. Of course, you could use whiskey, any sort of whiskey you want, or even tequila could work in this. But I like the smokiness of the bourbon. Then we've got orange juice. Again, really nice, complements the cranberry juice, the citrus. And then we're gonna take our cranberry sauce. And yep, we're adding it right to it. All right, we do a little shaky shake. I love this uh, the shaker because I've had it for almost, gosh, I want to say like 30 years. A lot of memories have come from this shaker and a lot of forgotten memories that I wanted to forget from the shaker. <laughs> and then you pour this over a nice size ice cube. Look how pretty that color is. Cheers. Happy holidays from my family to yours. 
Yeah, it's gonna be a good holiday. Now don't forget, if you wanna make any of these recipes at home, just scan this QR code below. Coming up after the break, we're gonna visit comedian Sebastian Maniscalco and his family for a truly tasty Italian classic. Welcome back to Hometown Holidays. Our last guest loves a great meal almost as much as he loves making folks laugh. Comedian, actor, and podcast host Sebastian Maniscalco is joined by his longtime friend, whipping up a beloved family staple. I find a lot of comedy happens around the holidays, at the table, with family, and my family's been very, very accepting of me kind of poking fun at them. We celebrate Hanukkah and Christmas. We honor the traditions of Lana's family and my family. The kids love Hanukkah. They're lighting the candles. They're saying the prayers. And they also love Christmas uh, with the Christmas tree. During the holidays, if you go on social media, you'll start seeing families dress alike. And I used to look at that and go, look at this. Could you believe that these people are doing this? Well, now I'm in matching pajamas with my wife and kids. Now, I actually look forward to what kind of pajamas I'll be wearing <laughs> Christmas morning. Sad, sad. Food really in our family has been a tradition of getting around the table, talking to one another, making each other laugh. Every Sunday we used to go visit my grandmother and it would be part of the quote unquote Sunday supper menu. There'd be pasta, there'd be eggplant. So over the years, I became very fond of her eggplant. Now, she had passed away. That recipe kind of passed away with her. And I came across this eggplant that Dom makes. I'll never tell him this, that it's better than maybe my grandmother's, but, uh, but it's pretty damn good. We are here at my home in Los Angeles with Chef Dominic Di Bartolomeo. And today, we're gonna make some eggplant. So take us through the process here. Sure. Now. So I think the first thing we're gonna do, and you know, a lot of people make eggplant parm with the skin. For me, I like to do it without the skin. We're gonna take off the head, we're gonna take off the tail, and then from here, we're just gonna peel it. Do you reuse? the skins for anything. So, because I know we got people out you, there going, oh my God, he's, he's throwing, throwing out the away. thing. He could use that too. So you could use this if you were gonna make like a caponata or something like that, you absolutely could reuse it. Okay, cool. But today, we're throwing it out. <laughs> Next up, guys, we're gonna take our eggplant and we're gonna slice it on the mandolin. The key here is to get it nice and thin because that's what's gonna make the great texture of the eggplant. So 
we have our slices of eggplant here. There's a lot of different ways to bread these. We're gonna take it from a beaten egg into the breadcrumb, and then we're gonna lay it out nicely on our platter. Okay. The breadcrumb is store-bought, right? So, look, I mean... Sit down. Just answer the question. <laughs> yes, the breadcrumb <laughs> is store-bought, okay. and there's nothing wrong with store-bought seasoned breadcrumbs. My grandmother uh -huh. made her own breadcrumb. Yeah, so... That's why I asked. Yeah. And you know, so, that's the problem with this generation, right? <laughs> so, Dom, I think we got enough slices to get this thing going. Well, let's do it. It's starting to bubble a little bit. You want to throw a piece in there? Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Nice, look at this. So two to three minutes on each side, we'll get a nice golden crisp, and then we'll lay it back into the pan, and we'll do our next round. Okay. Okay, now that we have the eggplant ready, it's time to layer it in the dish. All right. Let's start with a little bit of marinara sauce. And by the way, this is a very simple marinara sauce. It, the way you're saying marinara is uh, bothering. <laughs> <laughs> so now, take the eggplant and literally, it's almost like you're making lasagna. You're just gonna just keep layering it so that they're touching, but they're not overlapping. So now another layer of sauce. Perfect. We're gonna take shredded mozzarella. I'll grab a little bit of the Parmigiano Reggiano and just sprinkle it over just the way you did the mozzarella. And we'll just keep doing this all the way to the top. This is our last layer. You want to add a little bit more extra cheese, a little more extra mozzarella, a little more extra Reggiano. Okay. Okay. That's beautiful. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this, we're going to cover it. We're going to throw it in the oven at 350 for, for about 45 minutes covered, right? Mm-hmm. And then from there, after about 45 minutes, we'll uncover it and let it crisp up until golden brown, which should be about another 15 minutes. Okay. Golden brown, bro. Look at that. Wow, perfect. So I got my wife and my father here. They're going to taste test this. Their palate's unbelievable. My father has no filter, so if he tells you, it's going to be his honest opinion. So we'll awesome. take the plates. There Let's you go. go. This is the, uh, the eggplant. All right, guys, dig in. All right, let's do this. Wow. Delicious, bro. Very this good, Dan. so good. Very so, good. So, so, so good. Put it close to my mom. That plant tastes you? very, very good. I felt like over the years, Dom has become your second son. I love Dom's food. I really do. And um, I believe he is my second son that never had. Yep. Well, if I could just say, Dad, thank you. <laughs> Get with your family this holiday share stories, create memories, create traditions, and do yourself a favor. Do something nice for somebody over the holidays. With all that's going on in the world, all that matters to me is family. God, jeez, is that great. No? <laughs> Why am I not getting an applause? <laughs> well, there's certainly no doubt that family and friends truly makes each of our holiday meals just so incredibly special. From all of us at Today, wishing you a delicious and a very merry holiday season. Good Wednesday morning. Israeli troops inside Gaza's largest hospital this morning. A major raid in the hunt for hostages now unfolding. It is Wednesday, November 15th. This is Today. Storming in, Israel carrying out a targeted attack this morning. Intelligence from Israel and now the U.S. alleging Al-Shifa Hospital is being used by Hamas to carry out military operations and hide hostages. Intense fighting breaking out all across Gaza. And back home, hundreds of thousands march in the largest rally for Israel since the start of the war. We are not going to let history repeat itself. We are live in Washington 